the Bellingham Planning Board. Um, the first item on the agenda this evening is a continued um, public hearing on the 152 Depot Street Warehouse. Um, my understanding, Jim, we're in receipt of an updated sound pair review. That's right. Good evening, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so the, in your package this evening, you for 152 Depot Street, you have an updated sound peer review in response to the board's uh, comments and concerns uh, regarding uh, the proximity of vehicles, the sound wall, and, and the uh, closest abutter. Um, in addition, I believe the applicant has um, been looking at a few other um, minor additions to the plan set based on the board's comment, and it would be interesting to hear um, their feedback since the last meeting. Um, and I believe this evening is really just um, an attempt to really uh, wrap up a, a number of items that the board has been really uh, working through over the last few months. Okay. Also, I understand, Jim, we're in receipt of a letter from Don D. Martina. Yes, that's, Street intersection. that's right. So, yes, thank you. Uh, so, yes, you do have an updated letter from um, Don DiMartino uh, addressing, you know, kind of what the, the thought process is uh, with uh, Depot and Hartford Avenue. Um, and you do also um, in your package have uh, public comment from one of the abutters as well. And that information from the abutter. I believe has been entered into the record, correct? That's right. Yep. And we'll certainly include it uh, as an attachment from the minutes. So at this point, what I think I would like to do is have our peer review um, respond to the sound study and also have a discussion on the sound wall. Yes, I'd be pleased to do that. This is Greg Tachi. Uh, Kavanaugh Tachi Associates, Sudbury, Massachusetts. I um, have uh, prepared a letter that was dated uh, March 9. And this morning, um, thought that it would be easier to explain uh, certain of the results tables by uh, combining uh, figure uh, tables 2A and 2B together into a single table. So I would like to use that in my discussion tonight. That was um, as I understand, circulated to the board. Uh, you need to take over the screen, sir, for your presentation. Yes, I'd be pleased to. Okay. Do you see my screen showing figure 1A? Okay, it says I'm screen sharing. Are you able to see this figure uh, 1A, please? Yes, sir, we can. I believe the audience okay. can reposition themselves if they want to see it. <clears throat> Please let me know when you're ready. We're all set, sir. Thank you. Um, you there, uh, this is Depot Street. Here is the proposed uh, warehouse. Um, the circulation works this way. Uh, automobiles would come in here and park in this uh, auto parking here. Trucks enter from Depot Street do not uh, go around the east or the northeast side of the building. They stay on the southwest side. And if they need to, uh, they would go a turn around, to, a turn around in order to return back out to Depot Street or to back into the docks. Um, the uh, uh, features of the computer model that were used to estimate the sound levels uh, transmitted from sources on the facility site two nearest residences. I've shown three of them here, 226 Depot Street, 228 Depot Street, and 230 Depot Street. There are others uh, also, but these are the closest ones of um, likely of most concern. Um, the uh, red line, again, is the truck loop that they use in their computations to determine truck sound levels at uh, nearest residences. Um, 
at this location here, uh, 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 there's a little red spot there. That's where uh, Tech Environmental had placed their hitching and backup alarm sound. Um, and uh, from that, they've determined what the sound levels were at the residence and, uh, and determined that these barriers were needed. The barriers that uh, Tech Environmental recommended were 10 foot tall barriers. This first one was um, uh, 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 six, it says 60 feet long, I think that's quite right. It's a, and this one is 110 feet long, both of them 10 foot tall at about those locations here. Um, the, um, in their model, they included foliage in this area here, which has got foliage now. Um, uh, uh, so that is, uh, um, uh, you know, a feature that was included as a propagation loss for sound, sound transmitted from these sources on the facility site to these nearest residences. Now, one uh, thing that we did take a quick look at is uh, what the elevation of these residences are above grade. And we looked at Depot Street uh, Google image, a uh, street image, and basically uh, adjusted those a bit, uh, raising them, uh, causing these barriers needing to be a little bit taller. And I'll go through uh, our revision to the model, model in a minute. The sources that they use, we agree with. The position of the sources were acceptable. Um, uh, we did add sources. The heights of sources above grade were acceptable. So that uh, for the most part, the only um, uh, uh, sort of large uh, change that we might have had to make, it, maybe it's not all that big, is to raise the heights of some of these um, uh, 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 receptor positions. This is Can our adjustment. That? Yes, question? Do you want to raise the height of what, sir? Yes, the, uh, these receptor locations above the ground. The way computer modeling uh, works in CADNA is that you enter the uh, topography, but the topography doesn't reflect the, the height of the receptors above ground because uh, uh, first floor receptors typically seven feet above ground, grade level, and uh, two stories would be about 17 feet above grade level. So that uh, uh, just using the grade levels that come in from the topography uh, would end up um, giving you receiver position that is lower than, uh, uh, than would actually be the case. Is that uh, um, uh, maybe what I could show you is uh, uh, a Google Earth image. Um, just one second. Sure. This is a Google Earth uh, image. Here's Depot Street. The site is in this area here. This is the nearest residence, 226 uh, Depot Street. And Greg, uh, I, I don't think it's showing on the screen. I might be mistaken, but I don't. I don't believe the shared screen is. Got it. Uh, uh, let me um, let me reshare. So I'm a, a new share. Hold on one second. Uh, Are you seeing a uh, Google Earth image saying long-term measurement location at this point? Yes. Yes, okay. This is Depot Street. The site is in this area here. The entry to the site is down here somewhere. Um, this is 226 Depot Street, the nearest residence. Uh, what we can do is, um, uh, let me move this out of the way. The residence at 226 Depot Street is a bit tall. Uh, we put the receptor location up at this elevation. 
Uh, we estimated it to be 27 feet above uh, the grade. This is the grade here where the lawn is. The land actually drops off a little bit behind uh, in the backyards of uh, some of these residences along here so that it is kind of necessary to, um, uh, uh, to make an adjustment to reflect where the actual people would be that would be receiving sound levels. This also is important in terms of very design because um, at upper locations, we don't want to have a situation where you're overlooking a barrier that is too short onto the site. So the, um, uh, and it's necessary that the barrier break the line of sight between um, a receptor and a source on the site. Uh, so that uh, if the receptor is up tall, uh, you know, far above the ground, there's a chance that uh, a barrier that might otherwise serve a good purpose of screening sound for a person down at grade level up on the third story uh, may have a problem overlooking, overseeing that uh, uh, onto the site, uh, looking at those noise sources. So it is necessary to account for um, receptor elevation above grade level. Do you have any other questions about this? Yeah, so are you indicating that we need to update the receptor locations and raise them? What I did is I did that in the software. Okay. okay. Uh, and do you, the sounds meet the requirements uh, in Bellingham? Uh, uh, they 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 will with um, uh, they will with um, the um, the following changes, and these are the changes that I'm recommending. Um, First, this barrier along the, uh, the auto parking needs to be extended uh, up to this point here. And uh, the barrier that they had sort of dog legging around here needs also to be extended a little bit. The heights also need to be taller. This needs to be 17 feet. This needs to be 15 feet, largely because of uh, the need to um, uh, raise this uh, because in, in making the adjustment to reflect what we saw in Google Earth in terms of elevation of the upper story above grade level. When I did that, uh, the barriers that were originally specified by um, uh, uh, by Tech Environmental seemed to be a little bit uh, short in terms of uh, in sound attenuation. So in, in order to improve the sound attenuation to bring the sound levels down at, at uh, 226 Depot Street, I had to raise the barrier and extend its length. So in I essence, you, you removed, modeled that in to your calculations? Yes, I did. Okay. I also was able to remove the barrier that was here. Uh, it didn't uh, provide any practical reduction. And so I actually just removed it. So now we have just these two barriers, 17 foot tall by 225 foot long, and then 15 foot tall by 120, 120 foot long. I also added a truck idle at this location, along with a hitch and backup alarm that Tech Environmental had included in their model. I have also added a truck pass by, since trucks would come uh, into the into the turnaround as they're in, uh, entering the the turnaround. There, uh, the nose of the tractor is facing the uh, nearest residences, and so for that reason, I think it was necessary to make a test as to whether or not uh, that was a problem. And it turned out to be a driving force in terms of setting the heights and lengths of these two barriers. Um, I, we also had a number of other minor adjustments that uh, really aren't uh, uh, terribly significant. But what I'd like to do is, uh, is to show you um, uh, 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 tables uh, 2A and 2B summarize the results, but they are better summarized in uh, a replacement table that I provided this morning. And if you could turn to that uh, replacement table that I'm showing here on the screen now, I'd like to um, uh, uh, describe what the data is and what its implication is. It, Tech Environmental had placed barriers uh, on the site. Two people in the audience. I can go from here over over and say, if you want, I think the discussion may be fairly quick. Uh, shall I proceed? 
or are there Certainly, is there any question here that I can answer? No, I'm just having the audience look at the uh, what's on the screen. Okay, very good. Uh, for the backup alarm at 226 Depot Street, Tech Environmental, with the barriers that they're recommending, proposed uh, that would result in a limit of 43, uh, a sound level of 43 dBA, one dBA below the mass DEP limit. Okay. Um, at uh, uh, 27 Hartford Street, uh, it was at 29 Hartford Street, it was 30, they calculated 33 dBA uh, for, the backup, for the backup alarm with their barriers, uh, which would comply with the lower of the two ordinances, the Bellingham Noise Ordinance, which is a limit of 45. So um, uh, but where these levels all fell below the lower of the two limits, um, they found that uh, uh, the facility would comply with respect to backup alarms. Now, when I raised the uh, residence elevations um, to the heights that I had uh, gathered from looking at Google Earth imagery, I found that this sound level was actually about 5 dBA higher uh, with the tech environmental barriers. And so as a result, we end up with these red levels uh, where these levels exceed the lower of the two um, applicable regulations, Mass DEP and Bellingham Noise Ordinance. Um, if for the backup alarm, when we uh, uh, revise the barriers to make them longer and taller, uh, the, the uh, backup alarm sound level dropped below uh, the two applicable limits. This um, consideration of TE's barriers, our adjustment to receiver heights, and using TE barriers, causing sound levels to be, in some cases, unacceptable. And then uh, a third case where uh, our barriers are, are included in the model to bring sound levels down again. Uh, this is done for the backup alarm, for hitching impacts, uh, for acceleration of um, uh, uh, a truck uh, leaving a parking location, and then uh, uh, idling, which we had added, and uh, a truck in the turnaround. Uh, so uh, by using the barriers, uh, by installing the barriers that we had recommended, all of the sound levels would um, uh, fall uh, below the uh, required limits. And uh, uh, now, you know, there is one thing that um, uh, we uh, want to be a little, a little um, careful about, and that is, um, what is the actual nighttime usage that this might have? And um, uh, that is a consideration. However, there's no tenant here right now, so it's not really known what the nighttime usage is. Uh, but um, it is something that um, uh, uh, might cause barriers to be reconsidered were there to be a tenant use here that was daytime only. Now, I don't think that any tenant would ever want to sign a lease for daytime usage only, in which case, to protect the community, these barriers would be necessary. But those are that kind of argument might possibly be forwarded and is something that um, the board may want to consider, but that's outside you know, our consideration here because the tendency is not known at this time. Um, so um, uh, this is the result and um, uh, we do stand by the recommendation to raise the barriers, uh, I, I think, Tech Environmental did a good job in setting up the model and so forth, but um, and there were a couple of uh, things that needed to be uh, uh, further considered, uh, receiver height and uh, barrier height. And uh, those two um, uh, were significant enough to cause the barriers to change in length and height in order to comply with uh, applicable regulations. Now, if you please answer any questions. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, start um, Brian, uh, I don't, I don't have a question. What are these barriers going to be made of? Uh, there are many different products. Um, from an acoustical standpoint, the only uh, uh, that the, these barriers are conceptual. They need only be um, four to five pounds per square foot. That can be achieved with wood, it can be achieved with plastic and metal, uh, masonry, 
Uh, there's a lot of different products out there that will serve that purpose. They need to be um, tight to the ground and uh, need to be continuous and solid uh, without uh, cracks. For example, a stockade fence uh, uh, is not acceptable if crack area is too great. It has to be, um, uh, the cracks need to be sealed so the wall is continuous for its specified length. Thank you. Well, I guess the for peer review, you mentioned the nighttime. So the modeling that you have here does not apply to the night? No, it does. This is based on nighttime sound levels, uh, as it says here. Right, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Sure. The other question I had was the truck turnaround, the positioning of the truck turnaround. Um, can you put that up on the screen? Yes, I'd be pleased to. Please. This is the truck turnaround in this area here. Yeah, moving that closer um, parallel to the building, does that gain anything? Like the, that location, is there, would there be anything gained by the truck turnaround being adjusted? Sure, uh, let me uh, suggest that if you brought the, the turnaround down so that, that the building shields the turnaround, uh, that would be, uh, to a large extent, replace the height, reduce the height of these barriers, if not replace them altogether. Um, but it certainly would re probably reduce the height of the barriers. The only problem is, is that if you brought the turnaround further uh, southeast, uh, what would happen is that the turnaround would not be able to serve these, uh, these docks right here. Um, there may be some latitude to bring that turnaround uh, further southeast. Uh, and still be able to serve these docks. But that's uh, uh, the purpose of the turnaround is to allow uh, uh, a trucker to back up, uh, being able to look over his left shoulder at the tail of the trailer. Okay. Um, the letter that we got from you is the, from the ninth. Has the applicant had a chance to review these suggestions? And I have uh, sent it to them, but have not heard. And uh, I uh, apologize for uh, there, you know, the short amount of time they had to look at this, but I have not heard back from them yet. I'm sure we'll hear back from them this evening. Okay, I guess I'm, that's it for me. Just one question actually to the engineers is extending that wall, is that, do you think that that's going to uh, affect the site plan at all in any way? No, there would be zero impact to the site plan short of a modification of the wall. Everything else would remain. Okay. Um, I just have a question for the peer review is what's the normal height of um, barriers that you sort of work with like is 17 feet abnormally tall average low we try to cap walls at uh, at 30 feet which we think is you know unsightly uh, problematic uh, but it's necessary to reduce sound levels so um, uh, 17 feet is is tall. Uh, not that's certainly tall, um, but it's not as tall as some of these sound barriers get. And this question might be for Jim, but uh, Jim, do you know if Dunkin' Donuts has a sound barrier, and if so, how tall is it? Or if not, they don't. I can hear them right now. I, I don't believe Dunkin' Donuts has a sound wall, but I can uh, double back and, and confirm for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the comment made by um, some of the audience, I don't think the project at Dunkin' Donuts was as heavily vetted as this project has been, in all fairness to this board. So I think, you know, we've come uh, five I'll, years. I'll no, no, I'm just, no, just, I'm just, just saying, we, we're looking at a lot of things. No, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, we, we're trying to do the best we can. I you've apologize. Things weren't as thorough back then for people and neighbors. You've been nothing but fair with me. You know, I, I apologize <laughs> for that. We're really trying to vet this. I just want to, before can. we continue, I question the trees that are the foliage is there. I mean, it's, I can see the lights from Home Depot, right? Um, don't get done with it right now. So, I mean, how, 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 how good could those trees be? So, I don't know if that needs to be taken into consideration, but just. Okay, we can get to that in, the, in public comments. No problem. 
I can respond about foliage. Um, we removed it from the model and uh, just had uh, a ground absorption of one as if it were a grassy field. And the reason why we did that is uh, because of winter conditions and so forth. And, um, uh, you know, foliage is always hard to evaluate for its, uh, uh, how continuous it is and how dense it is. Um, so we have, uh, in this case, uh, removed it from the computations. I think that should address your question in a, in a positive sense. Thank you. I have um, a couple of questions. The wall that you removed, did that provide any screening at all? I uh, none uh, none in this uh, this area. It may provide some screening for a truck running at this point you know, along here, but the truck is closest at this point here, uh, and so that's where we placed our noise source and um, uh, and barrier heights have been and lengths have been computed based on a, posi on a position here. Uh, a position back here, yes, would have been screened. But uh, this uh, this also screens, so we thought that it was having two barriers doesn't um, improve the situation. In the case okay. of two barriers, the barrier with the the greatest attenuation is the one that is acting. Okay. Um, for the applicant, is it feasible to find a balance actually for the applicant and the consultant to move that turnaround area? to an optimal point where we gain some coverage from the building for sound, that's still be in the coverage of the height. Yes, that's that, definitely. That that's sweet definite. spot. Good, yeah, no, that's a, that's a, a definite uh, consideration that, uh, that can be made, should be made, and would have a benefit. I think the, you know, the applicant is open to, amenable to looking at that. Uh, we, we could take a um, and certainly take a take a look at that. Um, if there's a benefit to sliding it down some and kind of keeping the the, the flow of the, the site plan. Yeah, ideally, what we like to do is pick up on the advantage of having the building deaden some of the sound back. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there may be you know a couple of sweet spots we can find yep. that that may may accomplish that. Um, sir, I want to thank you for a very thorough presentation. You're welcome. It, it, it's much appreciative. Um, what I'd like to do now is, um, since we discussed at some length, I would like to open to the public any questions they have solely on the sound information they've been provided so far this evening. Mr. Chairman, if I may, real quick before. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, so uh, there is a question uh, on here from uh, Mr. O'Haran, I believe. Um, I don't know if he if you would like to unmute and ask it, or I can ask it either way. You can ask him. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's Mike O'Haran. Um, uh, so I can't tell from the visual on the shot of the plans there, but if the wall is tight to the pavement, right adjacent to the pavement, the sound barriers, the walls. Yes. Then um, and you said I believe in your presentation that they need to be tight to the ground to be effective. Yeah. Um, so how are you going to plow and what's what about water runoff and rain runoff and so forth? Where's it going to go if you can't have drainage and or a gap? And I don't think they're going to plow right up against a 17 foot wall, no matter what it's made of, to take a chance of hitting it with a plow. So sounds yeah. like there might be a little issue with uh, keeping that area clear and drained. Uh, with respect to draining, uh, no. If we had a two inch clearance uh, that would be fine for uh, drainage um, and uh, but the wall would have to be moved away in order to permit uh, snow storage and plowing and uh, I, i'm assuming uh, the applicant will take a look at that in terms of how runoff will will come off this wall and into the system they propose yeah absolutely any other questions from the public? I'd like to move on now to um, a letter that we received in regards to from Don Guy Martino in regards to the uh, Harford Depot Street intersection. Has the applicant had an opportunity to review that? 
Yeah. Um, what, is, what is your interpretation of the letter? So I, I think it's, it's our position that we had a, a mitigation package of $250,000 that we had offered to the, to the town. Um, we could either install a signal at the existing light as it, uh, that geometry of the roadway as it stands today, yeah. um, or we could provide those funds towards a larger uh, intersection program should the town so uh, desire to, to do that. Okay. Um, so to construct the, or reconstruct that entire intersection really isn't something that the project should or could uh, feasibly do. It's a much larger um, endeavor uh, than, than this project could certainly handle. Okay. So with, with that in mind, um, Jim, how old was it? When would, was that those figures determined by, by Don? Yeah, those those were uh, some years ago. I don't have it right in front of me, but I I would estimate at least five six years ago, if not greater. Okay. My point is, uh, our town engineer has looked at um, looking at intersection, replacing the signals. Has come up with a different thing. I, I think we're kind of light in your proposal to be very frank. So I think as we discuss the uh, impact, I think we may be looking for some more money for that signal to be set aside over time. We can certainly take a look at what he provided. The number he provided, I think, was for a, a major overhaul. Uh, no, Jim, I, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't it a 425 for a, a, a lesser overhaul? So the, the, the discussion from uh, Director DiMartino was regarding, yes, blowing out the intersection slightly greater than just adding lights. Um, and talking with uh, Don DiMartino though, um, you know, even that was somewhat of an interim step and, and hearing some of the concerns from the residents and those using Hartford Avenue, I think, uh, and, and at least my discussions with them was that uh, he would prefer or recommend, uh, as well as the town administrator would recommend, uh, funds to be used uh, as essentially um, a private private partnership with the town in order to do a, a holistic approach, not just at the intersection, but the quarter as we were talking about at the last meeting. So the, the number specifically was regarding the intersection and a slightly larger intersection with lights um, and I believe what the applicant is referring to is that their number references just strictly adding lights. Okay. Um, that's Jim. Hey, man. Sure. Um, Jim, the DiMartino letter talks about a comparable location and it, it indicates with very minimal geometric changes. So that's the figure that's listed there is without, the way I read that it was without major changes to the roadway, right? Right, well, yeah, I guess that's relative. Yeah, I mean, not, not doing a full blown uh, redo of the intersection, meaning um, many of you are probably familiar with Maple 140 and how we had to adjust the ge ge geometry of that intersection. Um, I think what Don's proposal there was of the lighter version was simply some slight widening so you can get a maybe a turn lane um, in certain areas uh, along with the lights. So, and I, and does anyone help else on the board have any comments before I? Brian? So I, I think that the light is sort of a, a critical component of how this warehouse could potentially work in, in my thinking about it is when trucks are to return to back to the facility, they are, I believe, modeled to come off the 495 and take a left, right? So without a light, they would be, um, we would be adding to that, to having a big truck take a left across 126, right? So, and if we delay sort of the, we wait for the funding from the state to come and 
and assist the town in, in doing it the right way, um, that could be some number of unknown years, right, Jim? Yes, certainly. Yeah. Um, going after state funding is somewhat of a, of a risk, and, and it certainly could be over, over a period of time, absolutely. Dennis? No, I was concerned about the time frame, but I'm also. Okay. Jim, um, I think it was recently posted on our on the uh, Bellingham website that 25% design improvement plan from MDM. Um, I think you're, you know which one I'm talking about? Yep, yep. So that's, that's the full board design. That's not what Don DiMartino is talking about where he got that number. No, that, that is what he's referencing is uh, MDM's uh, study from, again, I, I th maybe even a decade ago now. Um, uh, yeah, they've been looking at this for, for some time now. And um, so that, that, yeah, that's the one he's referencing there. And I guess what I'm, what, Don, like that letter that Don sent us and the figure that he came up with, that figure was a scaled back version of this 25% design improvement plan. Is that correct? Or is uh, that yeah, I mean, it's slightly scaled back, but again, it's somewhat relative. I know that 25% design was uh, ultimately going to, at the end of the day, achieve a much greater with, again, geometry and, and uh, drainage, I believe, and, and other aspects. This, that, uh, the reduce one wouldn't uh, do all of those features. Gotcha. All right. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, we need to, um, you know, discuss mitigation uh, further, maybe today or uh, later on. Um, you still have no idea on the tenant, correct? That is correct. Uh, there has not been a tenant identified. And um, I know initially you indicated that you thought this could be a nine to five operation and you fell on your sword, so to speak, and said that you made a mistake. And I, we were all disappointed, as was the town in the error. Although, you know, minor at the time, I might have been to the town, it was, it was rather significant. Um, we need to talk about spreading the traffic over hours. And I think um, we need to be realistic that in this current economy, uh, it's, it's not, and our consultant mentioned it. It's not realistic to have a warehouse not operating 24 seven. And I know you'll agree and we'll get input from the uh, public in a few moments. Um, I think we need to have um, a, a more robust mitigation. And um, I think um, I can sit down uh, with Jim, and, and look at that. I think there are some things we need to um, delve into. And some of them are as follows. Uh, I, I certainly don't like to um, negotiate in public, but um, at one point you put in the table that you would donate some land to the DPW, a certain triangle. Correct. Is that still in play? Yes. Okay. Um, what I would like to discuss, and I, I think it's very viable, is um, having you donate to the town um, 148 Depot Street in lieu of going to uh, 24 hours. So that can never be developed, would be donated to the town, and that piece of property in perpetuity could not be developed unless it's you know, used by the town. So I'd like to put you know, that on the table as you would want to discuss how we move forward. Um, board members have any comments on what we discussed for 
a more robust mitigation program. No, I think it's I'm in agreement that there should be further discussion. Yeah, I I agree with you. Yeah, I, I think there might be an opportunity for operations to continue at the at a facility if it was approved. 24 hours a day, but the outside activity will be limited to some hours or some window of time. So people that can uh, enjoy their their waking hours at their home and not hear the, the sounds that they might hear or a, a facility running 24 hours a day. And I, I, I concur with that. Also, I'm gonna throw an outlier to you. And I apologize, it just came up at a recent meeting. You should probably let your tenant know that we're going to um, look at in our um, discussion that you have to adhere to the um, Mass Oddly Law. Obviously, you've agreed not to put any um, vehicles on the street, everything will be on site. And um, the, the outlier, and I apologize, I did not think of it earlier, the tenant will have to develop some type of system uh, in accordance with the Massachusetts state laws um, to remove snow from top of the vehicles. So when they exit your vehicle, your property, that the snow is you know, no longer on top of the vehicle. I know as of five years ago, being a consultant for the transportation industry, the state uh, commercial enforcement division, the state police, gave you, I think, about an 18 month leeway on that. And now they are definitely ticketing people, especially trucks and, and cars that do not have the snow removed because of the hazard of the process. I think it's a fairly simple solution once you find out who your, your, your tenant is to make sure that it's safely done and um, removed from the top of the, the vehicles. And again, I apologize for not bringing up to you earlier. Now I'd like to open uh, questions from the public. Anyone here have any questions? Are we, are we done with all questions? Or? Yes, we are, okay. I believe. I, I think uh, Joe Antonellis would like to say a few words. Um, Mr. Antonellis, Attorney Antonellis. Good evening. Sure, sir. Good evening uh, to the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, how is Florida? It's wonderful. Um, uh, it's wonderful, uh, but it's but I'm not retired, so uh, okay. I'm, I'm still very busy. I, I wanted to just take a couple of, an opportunity. I hope what I'm about to say doesn't sound like a speech or a closing argument, but I, I do want to bring a few points uh, up regarding uh, this board's involvement in the project. Uh, my applicant's response to the board. Uh, excuse me, the applicant's response. My client's response to the board and. Um, I'll say some things very carefully. I think that this board is one of the more sophisticated planning boards when it comes to major scale developments that I practiced before. And I've been at this now for over 35 years and I've spent a lot of time in Bellingham. And I think the residents in Bellingham are well uh, supported by uh, the staff at the town hall and by your board in general. The quality of your peer review consultants is among the best that I deal with. The uh, extent that Mr. Tachi has done in his review of the sound issues has been significant. I can't imagine anyone looking at it more conservatively and more in favor of the town. Uh, again, a town that has its own noise regulations. Uh, we appreciate the effort that he put in I might, and our sound engineer might have a couple of academic disputes regarding how he modeled the heights, but we're going to let that pass. And I can tell you that we will adopt the recommendations that he's made relative to the height of the sound walls. I had a conversation with our client this morning, and um, I've advised him as I have all along that this board is very, very uh, concerned about protecting the integrity of the neighbor's privacies and that, and I believe that uh, the, the plan that we are presenting will meet all of the local bylaws, uh, specifically the sound one. So Mr. Chair and to the board, we were, we're going to react to Mr. Tachi's letter in a favorable way. 
just as we reacted to MDM's letters and suggestions in a favorable and cooperative way. I don't think you found any pushback from the applicant in that regard. Relative to the mitigation package, and I agree it's difficult to negotiate a mitigation package at a public forum, and I'm not sure that that's the place to do it. But relative to that, Mr. Chair, I will tell you that I will address the request for the donation of the land with my client. I think that what the public needs to know is my client does not yet own that land. Um, he has a purchase and sales agreement with multiple provisions and multiple options. We've run it up the flagpole because I'm cognizant of how this board tries to protect its citizens. And I believe that there is a significant chance that I will come back with a favorable reaction to that request, Mr. Chair. Relative to the triangular parcel and the monetary uh, um, uh, offers that have been made before, as John said prior to my beginning this, this, this conversation, those are still on the table. They will remain on the table. Um, we would like to move this hearing forward to closure. I don't mean to rush the board in that regard, but I do think that relative to the plan, and I, I know that, that Mr. DiPietro is on tonight also, and he has been very thorough in his review. I don't think there are too many outstanding issues as it relates to the civil engineering. And I'm hopeful that we can wrap all of this up in a timely fashion. I don't know, Mr. Chair, that it's um, advantageous for us to respond to the citizen letter or uh, some of the citizens' comments because, frankly, I believe those are questions that are being asked of your peer review consultants. Because again, as it relates to the interchange between the applicant and peer review, we've responded directly to them and through Jim. And I believe that our responses to your peer review people, to your consultants, to people upon whom you rely, have been forthright and have been done in a timely fashion. Uh, and we're willing to continue that exchange but I think for the sake of timing and for our own presentation, uh, as it relates to the public, Mr. Chair, I, I'm going to leave that to your discretion as how much you'd like to leave the, for the public to ask and who should provide those answers. But at this point, I really think that's going to be for your peer review consultants to answer those questions. Okay. With that said, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity. Again, I didn't want to make it sound like a speech. Uh, okay. It probably did. I apologize for that. But I, I, again, if there's anything that you believe the applicant has failed to do that's been requested by peer review or staff, then certainly please point it out to us. And I think John and I have the ability to make sure it gets answered in a timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, does, Jim, does Mr. DePietro want to say anything? Um, I'll make my little discussion very brief. Um, based upon the discussion at the last public hearing and the comments of our peer review letter, I think those could be addressed uh, either through conditions, often which are standard conditions from this board, or through additional conditions and some minor modifications to the site plan. So uh, I think that's really what my comments summarized would be at this point. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to um, open up to uh, the public. I'll do it. <clears throat> well, good evening, Jeff Mall, David P. Barry Devo. I, I'm here or on Zoom every time. Um, I appreciate what you were saying earlier. I do appreciate that the board has, I think, asked great questions, um, been very thorough, and really been you know, on top of trying to do what's best for everybody. And I, I do appreciate that. I know other people I've spoken to feel the same way. So I thank you for that. Um, That's our job. Huh? That's our job. No, I know. But still, like you said in the past, uh, Dunkin' Donuts is loud and terrible. I can see their, I can see their lights in my back mm -hmm. right now. So that's why I knew the tree thing was not right. Anyways, um, <clears throat> I appreciate the 148 because ultimately that that would close it down. I understand that no, the attorney says they don't own it, but they can buy it if they have a plan. So I got just direct to the board, not apologies. to the applicant. 
So my, 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 my real question is with this, with this light, right? My front yard is going to be a parking lot. It's going to have more trash. I mean, as it is in the morning, sometimes with, with the, with the, with the stop sign there, sometimes all cars are like at peak time, but trucks were constantly are stopping either right in front of my house or in between my house and, and the next house down idling. Not for a long. I'm 230. I'm 230. Okay. So towards the warehouse. Um, so my property is basically telephone pole to telephone pole. So there'll be um, either right in front of my house or in between the two houses. But I mean, their lights and they're slamming their doors and everything like that. So I know that'll. So I know what it's like to have a truck sitting literally right in my front yard. So I'm concerned that with the increased traffic with this facility, um, <clears throat> it's going to be constant, constant trucks in my yard. If you go forward now, in the in, in the the last meeting, there was a comment about how the developer had had or hadn't offered money to to residents. They have offered money because they offered me money. So we can confirm. I can confirm that because they absolutely did, and I know they confirmed it to others because other people. Told me that they did. I know obviously there's nothing in writing, but it was it was verbally verbally offered me money as as mitigation, sound, etc. I, I believe the developer, uh, not the developer here, but the the owner, I guess I would call him, uh, specifically mentioned specific trees that he had in his yard that he felt were good for um, sound mitigation. But you know that's besides the point. I know that that was offered. My next question is, if we go forward <clears throat> beyond what was offered, can the town do something, maybe provide stock, have the developer provide stockade fences or something, at least, you know, along, along the frontage of my property, so that as there are trucks idling, fumes, sound, trash, literally coming into my yard, I, I'm not going to be able to open the front windows to my house if there are trucks sitting parked essentially not parked but you know waiting for a light for who knows how long you know, i don't know what the timing is etc um they're going to be literally in my front yard all day long it's going to be impossible to get out of my driveway especially if i want to go left maybe i could go right and come this way but if i want to go left to harvard street that's going to be pretty tough because they're going to be queued up i'm sure right at the exit of my driveway so that's going to be a huge concern for me, okay. um, and it just—I know—I know that those the the the, the Menden and Hopedale potential um, warehouses aren't necessarily in our pur purview. But is there a way we can get the state involved in looking at, you know, further th that how bad that traffic's going to be? I, I don't know if you're aware, but there's I believe and. Please don't quote me on this because I don't have the exact numbers. I believe close to a million square foot of additional warehouses between my house and right to the other side of the Hopedale Airport, which is like a mile, less than a mile and a half anyway. So yeah, their sound isn't going to get me, but that even more trucks are going, going to be going out Harvard Street. So I don't know if, if, again, I understand that this isn't this project. I don't know what kind of purview you have over it, but Hopedale and Menden aren't going to see their their town resources, water, et cetera, is going to be involved, but they're not going to they're not going to suffer from that additional traffic. Bellingham's going to suffer for that additional traffic. So I don't know if that's a mass DOT. If, if, I don't know how that can all work, but we can make all the plans in the world we want for lights, et cetera, and then they're going to put those in and literally just drop a bomb into what we did, and it's going to be. It's going to be, it's going to be, I, I can't imagine how bad it would be a million square feet. I mean, that's got to be insane amounts of traffic. Okay. I, I've heard similar numbers. Um, I think one of the things that we discussed tonight was uh, I, putting the money in reserve so we can try to solve the problem when we do it mm -hmm. potentially once and for all. And not, not do a stopgap problem because it's like um, re, you know, retiring a street and retiring it four years later. Yeah. And we want to prevent that as best we can. That's why we're trying to look at the mitigation 
you know, for the lights to determine the best avenue to go through. Unfortunately, over time, everything has moved out west. 495 is, you know, after all these years, it's become very popular. I think you'll agree a lot of the traffic that goes um, from one way or the other on Hartford Street is mostly passed through residents. Yeah. A lot of it's not Bellingham residents. I, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, that's unfortunate. It's life. <laughs> I, I understand that, but it's, I wish there was more we could do. I No, I know. You like know? I said, I, to, your, to your credit, absolutely. There's nothing you can do about people. But if we're adding big warehouses in, there's something we can do about that. Our, our town, as well as Hopedale, as well as many, that's something that can be managed, mitigated, you know, maybe not 24 hours, et cetera. I mean, there are ways to manage this. I think that's something we have to look at in a group of towns together. That's beyond the scope of, the, of this board. I, that's why I was saying I wasn't sure how that all, how that all works and how we get the state of how, how that, I understand that's not I mean, we, we can, Yeah, we, we can, um, Discuss that with you know um, perhaps the town manager or uh, elected officials mm. down the road to see what we can do to get a better voice to represent something to the state house mm -hmm. and get you know um, more elected representatives uh, to support us as we move forward on that. Sure, but I think that's something that is um, big picture that we we should look at as a town mm -hmm. and as neighbors. But I, I don't think we can solve that problem tonight or the, you know, the next I wasn't, six months. I was just wanted that to be. However, what I would like to ask you to do, and I know, and I know he's made references that you've met with neighbors and you try to mitigate their concerns. I, 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 I know the perception was you were trying to buy people off. Could you just clarify what Absolutely. you're doing? I would be more so than we can happy. get it from your viewpoint, please. I was very. I'm not, I'm not saying he's incorrect by any means. I wasn't saying that they were trying to buy me off. I'm, I'm not I saying was, that. I wasn't. No, but some people had that perception on Zoom with the last. Week. I understood what they were trying to do. They were trying to say, "Hey, this is going to be, excuse my language, shitty for you. Let can can we can we maybe, you know, give you some some money to you know, build something or put some something up to to make it less shitty." It was, okay. was, was, was the feeling that I got. Okay. I didn't feel it to be a buy-up. Okay, it's all right. You're know, <laughs> one of the few people who can get away with saying that right now. I, I appreciate that. I, I perhaps would have worded that a little bit different. And I was very careful to <laughs> That's all right. what, I, what I said or didn't say based you didn't on say that. I bit, bit my tongue. But essentially, uh, the developer uh, throughout the whole process has been very open and at the request of the board, we did reach out to some neighbors and ask, hey, what can we do in the spirit of cooperation and mitigation and talked about potentially putting trees up if somebody needed that. Uh, and we did speak about that and that was something that was was discussed. It was absolutely not a, a, a buyout or anything along those lines. I understand. Lines, as, as you know, I did want to clarify that. Okay. Um, so I don't see what would change relative to seeing if we can work to provide some sort of a um, mitigation on um, gentleman's property that that may help at the end of the day with the concern here. As well as other neighbors, I assume they have already reached out to, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can certainly take, talk to everybody. And, and see that's on our place to yeah. delve into that. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we reached out to them before. We can certainly continue conversations. Okay, and I, I certainly appreciate that. And I believe you, you will appreciate what absolutely what I, I didn't think for a second that it was a buyout. I just want to I, I understand that but people were left with that, you know, they sort of left hanging in the air. Mm. And I just want to clarify that. Mr. Chairman, I, I think we do have a couple questions here online if you'd like. Um sure. and if if I if I may, uh, you know, the, the presentation tonight uh, you know address sound and uh, barriers around that. Uh, I know the, the, the general public has had a six month opportunity to express their grievances and concerns, but if there's nothing new to add, if you could please limit your comments to the presentation at hand, we do have a full night. Uh, there's one minute. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Di Diane, um, I believe you had your hand up first. Yeah, um, so Diane Troquette, live at 46 Box Pond Road. Um, third generation landowner, been through everything through Dunkin' Donuts, Best Buy, um, 
I'm only 400 feet from Best Buy. I know you talked about the wall. Uh, I get lights shining through into my bay window at night because we don't have a high enough wall and the way the lights are tilted, they're just shining into our home because there's no trees there, you know, all the leaves are falling off. So I know when you talk about the wall, I would, I would definitely go higher and actually do more towards other residents because it's going to have a great effect on other homeowners at the other end or the on Box Pond Road and Box Pond Drive. It is very noisy at Dunkin' Donuts when you walk the power line. So I just wanted to stress that as one concern. Um, the other thing that has never been brought up and I'm curious is the way this property is being developed, it's along railroad tracks. Now, Mendon has a rail, their stuff coming through on Monday nights at 10 o'clock, like clockwork. Yep. Is there any purpose or is there going to be down the road that all of a sudden this warehouse is going to start using the train tracks to rail in product into their DC? And now we have a train running Monday through Friday. I think you can get, you can get a definite answer this evening on that, sir. Uh, unequivocally not. If the grades wouldn't work for that, you know, okay. they would just help. So and then, then we could make that, you would not object to that condition? Would not. Okay. Uh, so, ma'am, I think they don't plan to do it, and okay. it will be a condition in the uh, decision as we move forward. Okay, thank you. you you're welcome. Anyone else on uh, on Zoom? Yes, uh, the gentleman who is not Holly, uh, if he would like to unmute. Yeah. Yes, I am Holly's husband, um, Steve, uh, 58 Box Pond Road. Just with regard to the... the um, noise study that was done. I just want to point this out, you know, as an observation that regardless of the noise study and if the decibels come in two, three, four, five decibels below whatever the limit is, you know, just please keep in mind that that folks are still going to hear noise from the building and it will be during its course of operation, albeit it may not be at the, you know, at, at the higher levels, but it would, will still be heard. Um, so the point, I guess, is not to eliminate noise for an abutter or those that are close, but just to reduce the noise. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to hear it, you know, throughout the course of the day. I live on 58 Box Pond Road. We hear trucks banging and clanging across the other side of the pond. I don't even know where it's coming from. So just keep in mind that, that you know, that's still going to be an annoyance for those that have to hear it. Um, and then the, the second thing I want to bring up is I know... It was briefly mentioned about the intersection and the money going for the light. Just once again, I don't know ultimately what that would look like at that intersection, but please keep in mind that anything less than a dedicated left-hand turn lane will not do a justice to that intersection and will make it worse. Anything less than a dedicated turn lane. And then lastly... We'll put um, that in mind, sir. Okay, and then lastly, before a decision is rendered, we do have a letter we want to give to the board, just kind of outlining everything that I brought up before, um, along with the petition uh, with everybody's name on it. So we'll submit that to, to the board. I can forward to Jim, and I appreciate that. Okay, and that's all I have. And I appreciate your input all the way through this. Okay, and, you know, We're you. not going to make a decision this evening, obviously. Right. But you want to continue. Uh, your support and thank you for your support. Okay. Uh, Jim, yeah, anyone else? Yeah, we have Mr. Hebert. Hi guys, Bill Hebert, 56 Box Pond Road. Uh, I just like to discuss, I mean, we're only talking about noise, so I'm gonna keep it to that. Like um, Steve was saying, we, we can hear everything backing up as it is right now. now this place is gonna be going 24 seven. So that means when we're trying to relax and enjoy our yard, when all the other places close, like I can't wait for the place to close over here cause I can hear them literally stop backing up at a certain point, 615, those guys are out of there, mm -hmm. okay? These guys are gonna be going 24 seven. So no matter what, anytime we try to enjoy this lake back here from now on for the rest of our time here, we're going to be here in 24 seven. We're going to be hearing those noises when I'm sitting here trying to relax after work and everybody, you know, any, any time I get a little break, it's, I'm, that's what we're going to hear at all times. I mean, 
at least if this thing's going in there, can we just help the residents a little and make it just a regular, you know, eight to five, nine to five, when everybody else is at work, do your duty and whatever. When we all get home, can't we just at least listen to quiet that we do have in this neighborhood? What little that we have left here from all these, I mean, I don't know if you guys zoom out on that picture and see how close that is to another warehouse. It's, you're cramming as much as you can onto this street for what a, a little bit of money towards a street light or whatever it's just it's not enough okay. we need more from this developer if he's going to be putting this much more hurt onto our town he needs to stick more into the town i i love the fact that sure if he gets that fact and you can block off 148 that's going to stop from a lot of noise coming to the residents but 24 7 it's it's just ridiculous. It's, it really should be stopped. I mean, from the first meeting, we heard we, we're going to hold them to fact about that 24-7. The first thing I said was not a chance. Not a chance are they going to do a 9 to 5. And here we are again fighting it that it can't be a 24-7 for some reason, and they don't even know the tenant. So I, it's just ridiculous. That's – I don't know. And – the developer's lawyer or whatever trying to just wrap this thing up and rush this thing and you know he doesn't know how far he wants to hear the people talk about this or whatever well we're the people that live here we're the people that are gonna have to listen to this nobody else here is right next to this we're the ones that will have to listen to that so our voices need to be heard and we're this letting is... your voice to be heard sir right we've, so we've encouraged that from the beginning okay that's, we, we, we certainly have not shied away from that at all. Right. I just really want to hint on that 24-7. At least give us a break. If this thing is going to pass, just give us a break and shut down at regular hours. Get the trucks out of here for the night. But I, I appreciate you guys listening, and you guys always listen to what we have to say. I know we get angry at times, but it's just we've had enough. And we've I had enough in this neighborhood. But thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. We also have uh, Casey here. Hi. Then we'll go to Mr. Hamley. Casey. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well, and you? I'm doing fine, thank you. Um, I had a question, obviously, um, the presentation earlier today um, by, sorry, uh, don't have my notes in front of me anymore, by, um, Mr. Tochi was about the sound. Um, I said a question because a lot of them at my house show right at the level. Um, does it wind up being, are there any instances where all those sounds kind of happen at once and it goes above the level? Um, I'm not, I haven't practiced enough doing math to do it quickly to figure it out on my own. <laughs> um, I'm ask Mr. Tochi to address that. So I'm just wondering, like, is there a chance that if multiple sounds are happening at once, close together, would they go above the 44, or has that already been calculated into that table? Well, um, I understand the question, and the question comes up all the time um, because there are a, a lot of things going on. But these, uh, the observations of that these um events uh, event sound levels are very short in duration and the likelihood that they would occur simultaneously is very slim and also the uh the source that's closest uh, uh to the receptor if it's uh, the, the loudest is going to dominate so that the contribution of the the further source the source further away uh could be negligible now where this might happen is um an event occurring with a truck idling and um we've always assumed that when a truck idles that it's its nose is facing the uh the residents but in fact yeah, that isn't always the case uh so it it, it is not customarily not appropriate to um uh, to add these together um if anything were to be done and i think it would be a slim chance is to, to add some of the louder um, uh, 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 events like the truck turnaround with a, a truck idling. 
But of course, trucks aren't supposed to idle for more than five minutes in the state. So that again, that likelihood of, of, occur, of those occurrences at, at the same time um, is negligible. And so we have not uh, included it in the computations. And I think if you've heard us, or with the uh, whomever the tenant is, regardless of the hours they operate, uh, they be reminded that the uh, to enforce the mass idle laws. That that's not a choice. So that you know, hopefully we'll reduce that exposure as best we can. I guess I was just concerned, like if there's the 36 bays, you might have a truck idling and then it turns off, but it's simultaneously the truck next to it is now idling. So it wasn't so much the same truck idling for an extended period of time, just with that many bays, you yeah. could have a truck idling and then another truck idling and then another truck idling, as well as a truck turning around and hitching and that sort of thing. Well, um, but that answered my question. So thank you very much. I would also like to further comment that uh, trucks idling at the uh, at the docks are highly screened by the building itself and uh and also the uh nose of the truck is pointing away from those depot street residences so uh the likelihood of it being an issue uh, is pretty slim all right uh can you one comment you raised i want to pick up on it and what i'm going to say will not make me popular in town to certain people um when you have a bunch of vehicles idling outside your um, house to the people on, on Depot Street, make a phone call down to the police department. They're not supposed to do that. Uh, I know it may not be popular when they start getting receiving the phone calls, but there, there's a, a law for that. And that's why it's enforced. So, you know, don't be afraid to you know, pick up the phone and um, let it know, you know, let it be known who they are. I can tell you, I feel pretty confident that you've heard from the applicant, again, regardless of what times they're operating, they will not, they will not have any vehicles idling on the street and the tenant will enforce the mass idling law. So I think right now what we have, and I may be reaching a little bit, is a majority of those vehicles, I think we can assume may come from Best Buy that are, that are idling. And uh, as we said earlier, um, in hindsight, things could have been vetted better back then. But now I think we just need to approach the um, safety officer who was at the last meeting to just try to you know, remind them periodically to enforce that. And then I think you know, once they start ticketing, um, we're, we'll get out that they're not allowed to do it. And once we can stop them from idling, and reduce the amount of time they spend on Depot Street. Hopefully, that will reduce the amount of trash that gets thrown out of the vehicles and whatever those bombs were that are being thrown out the windows that were mentioned going back to uh, November. Mr. Hamway. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just curious if anybody's given any consideration to the to, to the cumulative effect of those two warehouses that exist now. And then adding this one, is there any way you can address the cumulative effect of the noise with three warehouses now instead of two? Jim, can you address that? Mr. Amway is referring to noise, correct? Yes. Yeah. So actually, Mr. Tachi might be able to, in general terms, uh, reference it. Um, I don't know, Mr. Tachi, if you heard that the, the three warehouses there, Best Buy, Dunkin' Donuts, and this proposal. Um, would there be a way in which the applicant could generally capture that that noise and understand if it meets the current state? What uh, um, the the work that we have reviewed is with respect to um, uh, applicable limits. Now the Bellingham limit is a fixed limit. The mass DEP limit is based on the existing ambient, which would include uh, sound from distant uh, sources like other warehouses and so forth. So were we to turn the clock back uh, before 
you know, the significant development that's occurred over the last 30 years in Bellingham, you probably find that those sound levels were lower. And so in a sense, there is a cumulation effect, which is reflected in the background sound levels that were used to establish mass DEP limits. Um, it is a complicated question. How do we keep, uh, um, uh, you know, sound from escalating naturally as facilities get added and the background uh, becomes elevated uh, with more and more activity added? That is not a, a small question, but the, um, the, the, the elevation of sources that were previous to this project uh, is in part reflected in the background sound levels. Um, how would that ref how would that be dealt with? Well, uh, it would be a matter of, of developing an argument for a lower background sound level than was measured uh, by uh, tech environmental. That becomes the baseline to which the mass DEP uh, noise policy is referenced, which may end up leading to a lower limit than 44 which has been included in uh, the tech environmental work. Greg, could you uh, just, I know this, that, well, the limits, the Bellingham limits are 60, the DEP limits are 44, they're, they range differently. But could you give me an order of magnitude? What does 60 dB sound like? Um, two persons speaking, uh three five foot apart uh that voice level on average is about 60 db the thing that i hate to do is when i do that it it's out of context what i can tell you is that for a residential area that already has levels as low as uh uh the the 30 30 to 40 60 db would be loud that's a significant elevation over the uh, the existing. Uh, that's how uh, communities complain about sound. Their reaction to sound is based not on how loud the the, uh, the source is, but how it compares with what's existing. So the existing background sound levels are in some cases with 34, giving you a limit of 44, 60 would be a lot louder. Thank you. Mr. Hamlin. Thank you. Uh, another thing that I'm wondering if anybody's taken into account is, and I'm not indicting this company, but a couple of years ago, when June got involved along with Dennis Frame, that concrete company isn't quiet. Uh, I'm not saying they're violating anything now, but Jim will confirm the two, I think it was a year or two years ago, the noise coming out of there was so loud and so demeaning that my wife will attest the house shook. That part of the bathroom was like the fixtures were moving. That's from the concrete company. They were doing some big blasting of mm -hmm. concrete that had to be chopped up and carted out. But I mean, that can happen anytime that there's another factor there. And that, that affects Hartford Avenue people, Weathersfield Road people, even beyond up to Nason. And the deep, that, that, that company isn't very far from the intersection of Hartford and Depot. So that's another noise factor that I don't know if anybody's given any consideration. Uh, Jim, we spoke about that yesterday, correct? Yeah, I, did. I know the chairman did ask about any recent uh, noise complaints. And Mr. Amway, I did bring up that, that location as a, a somewhat of a chronic one for many years now, uh, not just from yourself, but from others in the area. Uh, the one good thing um, now, I know you're uh, you're referencing their noise concerns, but uh, this this entity would not be anything related to that, as the town did put in a bylaw a few years back uh, regulating um, outdoor storage or bulk storage. Uh, so that type of use would not be allowed at this location whatsoever. Um, but yeah, certainly understood that was a, a certainly a. a uh, issue that took a lot of time for myself, the safety officer, and, and more specifically the building commissioner. And that has been tightened up, correct, Jim? It has, to my understanding. Uh, you know, I certainly can sit down with Mr. Hamway and, and get his opinion as well. But uh, I know the building commissioner has spent a lot of time in trying to 
minimize impacts uh, from that that established site. So that, that that was a concern I had as well, sir. Yeah, the uh, the building uh, inspector did get involved, but over a period of like the, wasn't just one summer; it was a couple of summers. Yep, and, it, and I, I went to Dennis and I said, I thought this was fixed, <laughs> this problem, and it re recurred. And then Jim got involved, and then uh, the building inspector got involved. Uh, not a problem right now. No, and we are uh, looking to it. And it is in the future. It, 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 no, it is being monitored. Right. That, that has been tightened up. Thank you. Anyone else? So I think we need to um, continue this to uh, a future date. Um, what do we have for options? For options, we have the 24th, we have two hearings. Prospect Hill Estates, we need to open and get into that. And then we also have 353 Maple Street, which is aware of. So that's for the 24th. Um, April 14th, we have 206 Mechanic Street. So we could do it on April 14th. Gentlemen, um, the applicant and uh, attorney Antonellis, is the tent doable for you? Tim, is that okay with you? I'm sorry, uh, John, are, are you okay with that relative to the engineering? Yeah, it, from the engineering, there really isn't any engineering, okay. so it's pretty, you know, but, we can have a point tomorrow. So it's okay. not an issue. And then you can uh, you reach out to people and you can get back to us a little over a month on what those negotiations have involved. Um, sure. We can reach relative to the mitigation package, Mr. Chair? No, rel rel relative to um, the neighbors you've approached in the past and where that stands. Understood. Yeah, we, we can do that. The preference, I think, would be having that outside of the, the public forum. But oh, no, no, that's fine. But just the results, or you know, just say that it's been accomplished. Mm -hmm. We don't want. We don't. We don't know one of the details. As my mother would say, you don't want to see how meatloaf is made. You just <laughs> want to enjoy when it's eaten. <laughs> so I'll uh, leave it at that. Well, I would say, Mr. Chair, we'd like to get back quicker, but I understand the complexities of your schedules and the necessity of opening and, and moving hearings along. Um, I think we could be ready earlier if there was time on, on an earlier meeting, but if not, the 14th will do. Yeah, we have Prospect Hill, which hasn't opened. Um, so that's probably gonna be at least maybe 40 minutes, 30 minutes yeah. or 40. And I suspect we could have a lot of public input. We probably will have a lot of public input. And then we do have 353 Maple Street. Which we'll have some input. Which we have the review. So, so, so uh, I, I do think we have a rather robust schedule on the um, 24th. So we'll have it be uh, first item agenda on the uh, 14th if we can do that. Appreciate being first on the, on the agenda that evening, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you. You're welcome. It may mean an early tea time for you, sir. Uh, those, those are limited, too busy. Uh, anything else? It'll be, it'll be the 14th. To everyone here and uh, on Zoom, I, I want to thank you for your input. We value your input. Uh, I think you've heard and throughout this whole process that you know, we, we are listening and taking your advice into consideration. Mr. So Mr. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, did we do a formal uh, motion to continue to April 14th? No, we did not, and I will do that right now. I need to take a motion to continue this public hearing until uh, the April 14th meeting. Second. All in favor of the motion to continue to April 14th, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. As you exit, if you can just be quiet, we have some more business to do and for the people here this evening. Thank you very much for showing up.
Anyone here need a break? Okay. Just give us a couple minutes, I'll be back in a second. Agenda is a continued public hearing on uh, 206 Mechanic Street. I believe the board is in um, receipt, Jim, of a peer review by BSC. Yep. Yeah. So in your package this evening for 206 uh, Mechanic Street, you should have um, an updated peer review from BSC in terms of uh, traffic. Um, and Frank DePetro from BSC is certainly here to discuss it. I know the applicant also has been working diligently on the comments that have been uh, that were received since the last meeting, and I believe have a slight uh, a brief update. Um, so either either or for the applicant or for the board, if you would like to hear from the applicant first, or if you like to let BSC go, I'd like to hear from the applicant first, Jim, then hear from our consultants. So, uh, for the record, John Q6 with Fuller Engineering. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, here with Brandon Barry from, from our office and the applicant. Uh, I'll develop it, Wayne Finnegan. Um, so, we were before you last time, and I apologize, Paul Feldman's in the, on, the, on the Zoom as well. Um, we were here before you last time, went through the full presentation. Um, had uh, responded to uh, comments that we received from um, uh, from peer review on the um, uh, the civil side of things. Uh, we had a good dialogue relative to some comments that the um, the board had brought up at that point. Um, the one thing again to reiterate, we are fully committed to working with the board relative to the welcome uh, the Bellingham sign. We were hearing feedback that the board may like to see a, a stone sign with a with a wood face. Um, we will provide some renderings and show that and again we'll work through the, the, the board to provide what um, what the town thinks looks best um, beyond that we heard a couple of comments on the um the site plan i just want to run through you really quick just to see if it meets the intent of uh, what i heard that i thought you were asking for so we can work that into a final set of plans that gets submitted to the board to sure. sure that we got it um, so first off on the, the landscaping plan for the front of the site, uh, I need permission to share the screen. Gotcha. Did you get it? Did you get the media center? So the first comment that we heard, I think Mr. Salisbury had brought it up, was when uh, vehicles were traveling on Mechanic Street from, from the center of town, uh, heading towards Franklin. Uh, it was, you know, what's the, what's the view? Can you provide something there to provide a little bit more um, screening of that um, angle of the building, uh, to which doesn't show up on this plan. What I responded with was the budding building is pretty much a screen. It's, it's I think it's 20 feet off the street, but we're 70, uh, but it was still requested. You know, maybe we can look at doing something a bit more. So yeah, that's a good picture. That's the corner of the building. Step up there and traveling down. You know, you really just blocks a whole bunch of it. But the question was, well, what happens with, with this area? What do you then see when that building's not uh, blocking it? So what we discussed and what we added was along our driveway here, we've added a uh, fence right along here, screening anything coming in this direction with the, uh, the dock area. That was the main concern. Uh, what I will add is that the docks approximately 10 feet lower from an elevation standpoint from, the, uh, from where the road is here. So we've got the fence went up, up higher, everything kind of comes down. So screened it in that regard. Uh, while we're on the front of the sheet as well, um, I don't recall where this comment came from, but again, we have the berm on this side, 
we had the, the wall that's located here, and it was requested if we could somewhat connect those two berms, the berm and the wall, with additional landscaping to boost that up some. So we've added additional landscaping really in this area to tie those two uh, components together. The last comment that we had heard was on the rear of the site. Again, if there's something we can do to provide some sort of a, a buffer uh, this way. And again, we discussed, we're adding uh, green giant arbor buddies. Those are the ones that grow very tall, stay full uh, year round. Uh, and again, additional fence behind that on the side as well. But from a site plan standpoint, that's uh, the comments that I interpreted from the board. I would like to roll those into uh, the ultimate set that we submit back to you, but I just wanted to make sure that we interpreted the comments correctly. I think that was uh, correct assumption from the board as also from some of the uh, residents. Yep, that is correct. There were residents brought up, I think the rear one. Yes. And uh, did you have a chance to reach out to one of the residents? Uh, we did, and, when, and we being Mr. Wallace, uh, I, who I did not introduce actually, I apologize. Um, Do you want to pull up the chair, sir? I don't, there wasn't a, um, I don't want to speak for Mark, but I don't think there was ever a connection made. Uh, they connected, the, uh, the butter was going to think about, to, to Mr. Wallace, was gonna think about what questions he had and get back to Mr. Wallace. But I don't think you've heard. Okay. So, All right. so we have reached out. And I, I appreciate that. Any other new additional information? Um, I don't believe there was. Yeah, yeah, the only yeah. one other thing that came up John, was the letter that was sent to the butter to clean, to, to maintain the um, drainage basin. Oh, yes, yes. I actually forgot to submit that to these guys. Oh, okay. I will forward that. You asked Mr. Chairman about the. Um, yeah, just something so we could document. Yeah. So, uh, so Mr. Finnegan provided that to me, and I had forgot to submit that to you. So I will get that to you for your okay. record. But it was just showing that we reached out to them okay. to clean that basin. Okay. Now, um, the, the traffic um, peer review. Do you want to? So, yep. So, so from a traffic peer review, and I and think um, you know Sean can 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 speak to that. But we provided just a quick letter to you today based on those which i know you haven't read nor yep. expect them to have um but we went through uh we received a comment and done a quick um, response to them from the uh, the civil side of things uh, they were just very uh, very minor comments um you know number one just had to do with a um uh, site plan brand um First one that really had to do with right here as cars were coming in, they weren't sure if there'd be a, enough room for cars to turn around and come out. Uh, there's there's a, a paved area that's located here to provide room. Based on that comment, though, what we're going to do is we'll provide some more room. I'm actually going to stripe out a stall right here that um, you can't be parked in. So if somebody comes in, they can back up this way. If okay. Going that way. So we will add that to the future plans. Um, there's a question about the size of the docks if they thought they were 11 and a half feet wide there wasn't a dimension on there they're actually 12 feet wide we will add that dimension but it doesn't result in a plan change we'll dimension that just to show that the 12 feet um, will that reduce the number of docks no okay no, no it's, it's, it's the same i think it was just a I, i'm sorry i had to ask no i understand <laughs> i understand um there was a question about the, uh, the, the details. We had a striped area of um, about eight feet on the accessible parking um, stall. The details showed it as, as nine feet. It was just, uh, it was just those not matching. We'll get those to match. Uh, the, de the detail will change, not the site plan. Uh, and then the last one that really had to do with this area up, uh, up front here. Uh, they weren't sure if this was a four foot walk and they're concerned about uh, cars overhanging it. It's actually a five foot walk. So we've got a five foot walk and a five foot landscape bed, which we feel is appropriate. Um, I would rather keep it at five feet in the five foot landscape bed than make that walk even larger, uh, shrink the landscape bed. Okay. Um, 
actually sounds funny, but between four and five feet makes it different from what you can plant there. And that was it on the civil related stuff. I'm yep. going to turn it over to um, to Sean Finas uh, to, um, to talk on the other items. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Again, Sean Kelly with the NASA Associates. Uh, we, we did go through the comments that were issued by BSC Group in their re a review of the traffic study. Um, they're, they're all pretty straightforward. You know, they, they had asked if we had had any uh, coordination with MassDOT as, as part of our um, permitting efforts. Uh, Route 140 is under MassDOT jurisdiction, and we will be subject to a, an access permit from the District 3 office. Um, we did have an initial meeting with, with District 3 staff to review the project and look at some of the recommendations we had with respect to uh, Mechanic Street and Maple Street. And then MassDOT also took part in the MEPA scoping meeting that was held on the project as well. So we, we have had some coordination efforts with them. Uh, there was a question about vehicle queuing analysis. And I know a lot of the focus really has, has been on the southbound queuing on Maple Street and potential measures um, to, to improve that the queue storage there. Um, but as part of our assessment, we did look at the impacts on all of the other approaches as well, um, including eastbound on, on Mechanic, which was their, the issue they had raised. And what the analysis showed is that even um, utilizing the, the highest trip generation rates, if you may recall, we, we looked at this more of as a high queued sort facility, um, not a general warehouse space, which is really what it's sized for. But even utilizing that most conservative analysis with the highest generating use, you know, the, the average queues were increasing by less than one vehicle length uh, during peak hours. Um, there was a question as to whether or not if there's a left turn restriction on Mechanic Street, we would have, you know, signage and and again, it kind of falls back to the, this is a mass DOT corridor and ultimately, you know, there is a process where they review the access plan, including any pavement marking and signage that's required. Uh, but certainly if a restriction was in place, we, we would expect that a sign would be held either on the driveway or on 140 itself. Um, and then the last question really dealt with the timing and phasing at Mechanic and Maple and whether um, we were proposing to change that. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, we're, we're offering the town, as you know, um, a quarter of a million dollars towards uh, traffic improvements, um, modifying timing is a relatively low cost measure. And certainly if, if the town or, or MassDOT felt that it was warranted, those funds could be utilized um, to advance that as well. Um, and that was really it in the traffic study. Um, you'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. How many for have questions? Um, Frank? Floor's um, yours, sir. Sure, good evening. Frank DePetro from the BSC Group. and. I had a long discussion with a traffic engineer, Bill Paley. So please excuse me if I'm um, uh, playing a traffic uh, transportation engineer this evening. Um, I think um, just listening to the responses, we want to take a look at make sure that, that they're um, actually responding to the site things. They seem to be reasonable, but we'll certainly take a look at that letter that we haven't seen yet. Um, with regard to the traffic impact assessment comments, a couple of things uh, that sort of um, Bill and I talked about, and I believe Jim had some input in this as well. So one of the items that we understand has, has become sort of a question is that uh, right now my understanding is the uh, quarter of a million dollars offered for improvements really look to address the through a lane going through the intersection. And there's a real question about, you know, would there be a benefit by increasing both the through lane and the turning lane? And I think that's something that we would be very happy to take a look at. We can certainly we, we respond to that comment for the next planning board hearing. Um, I think that's something that we, we want to be important to take a look at. Um, the other question that came out of this was relating to the, the discussions with Mass DOT District 3. Uh, again, thank you for providing us the information that they've had some initial discussions, certainly the MEPA scoping session and uh, intermeeting. Um, the concern we have is that until Mass DOT sort of weighs in, uh, a mitigation is just a plan, a concept, and really uh, whatever is going to be proposed, it has to be reviewed by Mass DOT before it's going to go anyplace. And so while that's something that I think would be very uh, a good offer, at this point in time, until Mass DOT gives some blessing to this, if you will, some better direction, we're only in the, the beginning stages. And again, I would certainly defer to the folks um, at Bola to make sure that I'm, I'm not missing something. But again, I think there has to be more definition with Mass DOT to be able to say, this is what they'll allow, this is what they won't allow. Um, you certainly won't have your highway access permit. 
But again, I think if there's a little bit more direction, uh, contacts with the master deed that was provided, that information was provided to the board, it would help us to make a better decision overall. Okay. Um, so I'll be Frank, quiet now and not pretend to be a traffic engineer anymore. How long a time frame do you think that will be? Uh, again, I think, um, so, well, let me back up. Mass TAT is very busy, uh, and it, it might take a little bit of time pulling stuff back and forth, but I think certainly folks could reach out, uh, and certainly that may be something that the folks um, from Bower, uh, you know, would, would be involved in. I don't want to volunteer BSC to do that. I think it should be run through the applicants, engineers. would be happy to be part of that coordination. I would appreciate so I'm that. Sure to, refer, uh, to the folks, the applicant for that. Okay. If, Mr. Chair, if I could just speak to that. Um, uh, that was absolutely correct, what was, um, what was uh, presented. I, I think it was uh, flipped. When I, I think we had thought that it made sense to put the, the turn lane in, but there was this, some discussion relative to would the through lane make, make more sense. Okay. Um, so just a small point of, of, of clarification. But really, um, ultimately, the, the critical path of this project is going to be the DOT permit. DOT needs to issue a permit. DOT doesn't issue permits until we've got our, our approval. So they want to make sure you've got a site plan approval, then you move forward to DOT and you start that process. When they're slower, sometimes they can cheat it in a little bit. When they're busy like they are now, a lot of times they're very, no, get your local approvals, then we'll review the, you know, submit an application, then we'll review it. So what we're hoping to do is get some direction from the, the board and the town as to what they would like to see by way of, of mitigation. Again, we, we presented what we thought made sense. Um, we'd be very interested in your, your peer reviews comments. It's, if there's something they thought might, might make sense, does it uh, generally uh, work the concept that, that we have, which again, we, we think it does. Once we've got that general um, consensus to say, this is what we would like to do, we can then release our traffic engineers to actually make a, a design to submit to DOT. Okay. So we can reach out to try to get some input, but we haven't really had much luck other than what we presented during NEPA, which showed, you know, talked about, um, you know, the turn lane and stuff like that, and, and they didn't have any concern okay. with it. I'll try to summarize, I think, what both of you were saying. And Jim, interject if I'm wrong. I think what Frank is trying to say is the, the initial offer is much appreciated. However, there could be something that the state says that could increase the, you know, the need for the town more than we anticipated. Is that a fair assessment of where, where we could be? Uh, yes, and again, I think this is highly unlikely, but maybe the state might say there's less needed, but that's just the, the point. Right. We need and that correction from the state. And, and Mr. Chairman, I think we're we're close. We're not quite there yet. I did speak with BSC and 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 Frank and and Bill Paley. I, th I think the the one missing link from our peer review response was a little bit more detail as to whether or not um, the extension is necessary on left, right, middle, um, and and whether they you know that's a, that's a nice to have or or what have you. Uh, and then I think that's giving the applicant some direction then to go to DOT, mm -hmm. which the town certainly can play a role in as well as help help uh, steer that along to get that more refined um, and get a little direction. DOT, I, I think everyone is absolutely correct in their statements that DOT um, likes to see uh, local permits first, uh, but will certainly offer some uh, some opinions if uh, if it looks like there's a strong opinion from the town that they want to see a certain direction. So I think we're pretty close to that. I think at the next meeting, BSC, uh, I believe we'll, we'll have a little bit further guidance for the board on that. That's so um, in summary, the town, our peer reviewer, and the applicant are all on the same page on this. Can I, can I uh, it's Paul Feldman. I, I, I need a clarification if it's okay, Mr. Chairman. Certainly. Uh, good evening, everyone. Paul Feldman on behalf of the applicant. Um, I just want to uh, understand in my own mind, Mechanic Street is the state highway where DOT has jurisdiction. And um, the, um, the uh, Q analysis and the traffic analysis shows that 
you know, me Mechanic Street is not being impacted. The, the concern that we heard uh, when we were before the zoning board and some initial concerns we heard from this board was the southbound traffic along Maple Street. That's not a state highway. That's something that, you know, DOT's, you know, not going to particularly weigh in on. The, can we, uh, one second, can, Sean, can we get clarification on that? I, I don't think that's entirely accurate. Well, we're just, Jim, if I can, that's why I'm, I'm asking for clarification and we, we, we can get Sean to, to do that because that's what I'm trying to figure out here, that if, in fact, the planning board would like to see um, uh, additional width to Maple Street, certainly that width, uh, that width on Maple Street is not, is not uh, jurisdictional from Mass DOT. When we get to the intersection, well, then it is. But the, right now, there's a right turn lane leading into that intersection that's about 75 feet in distance. And uh, what our traffic consultant has recommended is that right turn lane be extended so that cars that are coming south on Maple that want to make a right turn are not being held up by cars that are wanting to go straight. So they have to wait for the light to turn in order to be able to drop into that right turn lane because the right turn lane is only 75 feet long at this point. Now, I, I, I understand it makes sense to look at, well, is the right turn lane that's gonna be extended or should we look at the, you know, what happens with the left turn lane? But all of those changes on Maple Street, and, and I, I, I always understood, and we can hear from Sean, needs to be determined locally. And then to the extent they affect the intersection, well, sure, there's gonna be mass DOT involvement, but I don't think there's any physical changes to the intersection itself that are planned. The changes are along Maple Street. So that's the clarification I'm interested in, and maybe Sean, you can help us out. Sure, thanks, Paul. Uh, no, Paul, Paul is correct. So Route 140 is under state jurisdiction, and that runs to the intersection all the way beyond the site to the east and west. But Maple Street, aside from, I suspect, a very small portion that's, you know, where the curb returns occur and where there's traffic signal equipment, once, maybe, can I do a, sh a screen share? Would that be possible, or? Uh, oh, Pam, could you allow for Sean to? Yeah, it looks like I'm up right now. Um, all right, can everyone see that all right? Thank you. So this is this is all state jurisdiction. Maple Street is local jurisdiction. It, there may be a small portion of maple that extends up into this area where there's, there's you know things such as loop detection or signal equipment that's in the state jurisdiction. But certainly when you get up to this area, you know all of this area here is in the town jurisdiction. So so Paul is correct. This this lane extension really would be a more of a local approval than a state approval. Um, what we would propose, to, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head is. You know, you, this right turn lane was built here, and what I, what I suspect is that the state simply ran out of right of way, and there wasn't enough room to extend this lane. But this lane really has no, doesn't really function today. It has, during peak hours, certainly it has very little purpose. Um, we show that the average queue in this, in this lane here, the maximum queue goes back 230 feet. So what effectively happens is this lane fills up, and then cars that want to make a right-hand turn, you know, aren't able to do that. Um, we have the, the left turn phasing here where you get the, the right arrow to go with it. You know, they basically are stuck back in this area. They can't get into that lane. What we had looked at as part of our work was, um, uh, hopefully, was this show? Um, was to essentially take that right turn lane that exists today and extend it back all the way back so it's long enough that it extends as far as the through queue. And what that allows is this is actually a functioning lane now. You, even when cars are backed all the way up at the peak hour, you can get into that lane and make that right hand turn because today you know the lane even though it's marked essentially it, it doesn't it doesn't function it's it, the left and the through is really a one lane approach because you can't get in the lane so we had looked at this and what it showed is that the operations for the southbound movement were improved dramatically because now it you know instead of operating as one lane it operates as two um and i think that you know when if we can certainly provide bsc group with all the you know technical backup and what have you but i think it you know, certainly demonstrates that adding that capacity and letting this be a functioning lane improves operations, you know, particularly during the, the peak hours. And, and, it's, and just to, 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 the reason why I wanted this clarification is that 
it's precisely because mass DOT is so backed up and so jammed that it, the, the ability to get them to react to something that's not technically within their jurisdiction is going to be very, very difficult. It's really, we really need the guidance from the planning board and from the planning board's consultant and our traffic consultant to decide, you know, you know, will extending that right turn lane um, improve the function of that intersection? We think it will. Um, just so, so we're clear, you know, it's not that our project is going to in, greatly impact the, the intersection. What we're, what we're really trying to do is demonstrate to the town that we're prepared to not only mitigate a problem with that intersection by giving the land that you need in order to create the extended way, but we're actually prepared to, to build the extension, relocate the utility poles, you know, build that, that additional lane of traffic. Uh, that's where the $250,000 comes from. Um, and, and, and because Mechanic Street has already been studied coming out of our site, the question for the planning board and the applicant um, is indifferent about this, but the question for the planning board is, do you want to restrict a truck leaving the facility on Mechanic Street from making a left turn out of the facility in order to go toward 495 on Route 140. Um, the applicant is open to directing all exiting truck traffic in a clockwise direction uh, that need to go toward 495 out the Maple Street Drive for a right turn only and then the truck would make the left turn at the intersection. But if the planning board felt that one way to add added relief to that intersection on Maple Street was to allow trucks to make a left turn out of our driveway, just like the abutting building trucks do. The, the, the trucks make left turns onto Mechanic Street all the time. If that was what the board preferred, then one of the things we would deal with with mass DOT is whether or not there's any, you know, lane, lane striping or markings on 140 that should change or anything like that. That would certainly require mass DOT approval because that's their street, that's their road. They control that road. The, the other thing that the applicant was open to and it was one of the comments in the uh, BSC review was you know, whether the um, a study should be done of the timing and sequencing of the lights. Um, and, and, and as a result of that study, would there be any proposed changes to the timing or sequencing? Again, we could conclude that there are some proposed changes and if Mass DOT disagreed with us, Mass DOT, Mass DOT would rule the roost, but you know, if we provided them the, the, the traffic data study backup that would suggest the intersection would perform better with timing and sequencing changes, we would expect Mass DOT to be open to that, and we would then go ahead and implement it. What we're trying to say is our particular, this is, we understand this to be a, a, an intersection which, even though it was just rebuilt and it looks really good from the sky, we're told and we hear doesn't function as well as everybody would like. And because of our project, it creates an opportunity to spend quite a bit of money to get it to function better. And, and, and most of that effort is on Maple Street. It's not a DOT decision. It's a planning board decision with your consultant and our consultant. So I, I'd like to just ask that that dialogue occur right away because once there could be a meeting of the minds between Vanessa and BSC as to you know what should be done uh, uh, to to improve the intersection coming south on Maple Street that's the driver that's going to really let us you know get our site plan approval and then we can go to Mass DOT and talk about the minor things like road markings and timing and sequencing of the traffic lights that we would have to do with mass DOT. That's the reason why I wanted to have the clarification because 
uh, it would really be detrimental to the applicant to send us off to Mass DOT now when we, when we really want to talk about Maple Street and what you guys want us to do to Maple Street. Sir, thank you for the clarification. I think we're all better, we all have a better grasp on what to do next. Frank, do you have anything else you need to add? No, I, I, I think in a way, if I understood um, what Mr. Feldman just said, we're sort of talking the same thing. That is, we're looking to get the board and um, the applicant as well as both uh, Vanessa and uh, BSC to, to sort of come to an agreement that would give some direction to Mass DOT. I mean, I think whether or not, you know, making the changes as they're talking about on Maple Street may require a um, modification of the signal timing at the intersection. I don't know that it's a very theoretical thing at this point, but it may. And therefore, that expansion would have some impact. It could have some impact by a decision from Mass DOT. So I think certainly we'll be looking to get a little update to you folks in the next week or so. And then this will be something we could talk at the next hearing if you'd like. Okay. That would be great. I think that makes perfect sense to me. And, and, I, and I thank you for the clarification. Uh, sure, I can't take well. Thank you. Anyone else? My opinion. Do you have any questions or comments? Yes. Um, are we going to create a kind of a bottleneck if they you if they use to be able to come across out of the southern one on Mechanic Street? Because they're going to have to if they're going left, they're going to have to jump the lane. So you're going to have to coordinate everybody. If a guy doesn't want to let somebody go and he's backed up there, that truck's going to cut off that lane. We're going to wind up in a situation we kind of looked at at Lincoln Project where we needed a light. And I don't know if that worked. I don't mind them maybe coming out and going to the right, if need be. Coming out or further down. Right? Yeah, well, yes, exactly. exactly out of that exit there he's talking about. The lane on Maple Street, I love that idea. You can extend that as far as he wants. Mm -hmm. Just my opinion. Can I, I, Again, we're. We're, we're perfectly, uh, if, you, if the plan board wants to impose a condition that tr left turns out of Mechanic Street Drive are prohibited, we would abide by that condition and put a proper signage and not allow left turns out of Mechanic Street. Again, we, that's, that's an issue for the plan board to decide what it prefers. The applicant is indifferent on that issue. Okay, thank you. So, uh... So I, I agree with Dennis. I, I don't think left turns are possible with trucks there. So that that's good. Um, and while I think of it, it would help me immensely if I could um, see where the entrances are. If we could stake them out, and I don't know if it's a full site visit, but we might as well if you're staking. Why don't we have a site visit so I can see? Okay, the trucks are coming out here, and the intersection is that way. That would be very helpful to yep. me. If we can do that. Um, so my understanding is the trucks would are not good with directions. They would leave the facility onto Maple Street, take a right. That would be heading south, right? That's how they would leave. And yes. Then the trucks would swing into, presumably most of them would swing into the left turn lane to go towards 495. Correct. One of the one of the things that I have observed there already is that there's about two and a half trucks distance of, of, of space in that left turn lane. Now, we don't know who the occupant is and, and, and how the trucks will be released, but if there's more than two at one time, it's going to effectively block the existing left turn lane if there's any other additional traffic because it, the, the existing left turn lane starts as a triangle and then merges into um, a full lane. So I, I would be interested to see what the, how many trucks could actually fit and how the, does the mechanics of the releasing of the trucks at this facility work in that cycle in terms of a potential issue that we need to look at. And then with regard to traffic traveling west to east, I think it's the direction from the center of town to 495 on, on Mechanic Street. Um, what I observe now 
is that the um, the left hand turn lane to turn onto Maple Street backs up fairly quickly because it's stubby because it shares it's one of those flip lanes where if you're going in this direction you can take a left to the gas station across the street and, it, and further up it flips over to this is the lane you get into to go left so that that left turn lane going in that direction often backs up going towards 495 and then what happens is you have a bunch of people that want to go left that can't get there and then backs up the other lanes of traffic so i I don't know how many, I would imagine that trucks coming from the center of town back into the facility would go through that light, take a left, and then get back into the facility through Maple Street. I, I would be interested in looking at that, um, how that would work if there's additional trucks, or one or two trucks that are queuing in that area, going left at that place. And then in terms of the trucks, the, the vehicles leaving, the non-truck vehicles leaving, <coughs> um, Mechanic Street, they can, so if I work there, I can drive my car, I can take a right. I don't know if it's a good idea if I take a left, even if I'm in a car, um, because you're still crossing a bunch of lanes. So let's look at that. Um, but are the, are trucks coming, are any of the larger trucks coming through the intersection and then turning into the, and I guess they are, they're turning into the facility there. And is it gonna be, a, and I imagine you've already figured this out, but as long as the trucks don't have to swing out and come back and turn right, there's enough swing space to go right in so the traffic keeps flowing through that intersection. Because if, if, if trucks are slowing down to make that turn, then perhaps there's a, a backing through the intersection. But again, I think this would all, if I could see, could see staked out where all this plays out, it would be very helpful to me. Again, Mr. Chair, one point of clarification of everything I just listened to. I, uh, I thought that, um, and I, I can't tell who's speaking because it, you guys are too small on the screen for me to figure that out. but. I thought I heard the person say that that trucks could turn into the facility off of Maple Street. That's that's not right. That that Maple Street driveway is going to be an exit only driveway for trucks. You can't turn in a truck can't turn in to the facility from Maple Street. The only way trucks come into the facility are off of Mechanic Street. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to confirm my understanding. I think we've been working under, under that assumption from the beginning. Okay, uh, fair enough. I thought I heard the speaker say that a truck may turn in to the facility from Maple Street. Not a truck, cars will we'll get to the, to the vehicle parking in front of the building in and out of the Maple Street driveway, but a truck won't be able to turn in. It's designed not to allow a truck to turn in there. So what we want to do, is to have on this uh, warehouse of all the access to the warehouse property coming off on and off of the chemistry and everything except turning right of the property to go around the property and exit on Maple Street. Is that a correct assumption? So, so the one there will be no left hand turn coming out of the entrance. So, so the that if. If that's what the planning board wants, no oh, left hand turn. Right. I'm sorry. That's. I think we've already. That's been outlined before. Correct. Yes. Yeah, we're, one clarification. Yeah. Just to be sure. Yeah. Sure, just making sure. <laughs> um, so the one clarification. So the, the truck traffic is all entering from mechanic, as as, as discussed. Yep. Um, the employee traffic is coming from from Maple. Correct. So that, that, that's entering from Maple. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Entering okay. and exit. Okay. Yeah, I'm not at, not I'm not exiting. So no, no mechanic. employee car. Only trucks. Yeah, we want to. We cut you. We want to separate the the trucks and the cars. So the the, the yeah. So that so the um, the cars are coming in and out from from Maple. Okay. Okay. Trucks are entering from mechanic. 
Okay. So, right. It, but they can exit on to Maple. They have to. Correct. Right. Unless they're going right. Unless they're going right onto Mechanic Street from the main. Right. Yes. Yes. Correct. And I know I'm calling it an entrance. The main exit entrance, so to speak. But uh, most of the vehicles will enter the facility from that location on Mechanic Street, right. other than employees. And they'll be prohibited from doing all. Oh. Oh, yeah. All right. Could you put that on your, your, your device that a friend's enter exit? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just the, just the label. So exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's, absolutely. Thank you. So one of the things you can't see from this drawing is is the lane, the three lanes, the coming out of Maple Street, heading towards Mechanic Street. And I guess I've I've got the same concern that if you're coming, if the trucks are coming out of your Maple Street exit, they've got to cross. You know, where point did you have the three lanes going all the way back? Can you put that other drawing up? Yeah, Sean had that. Yeah, yeah the, the one we were looking at before, because that's what I wanted to see was where that, and I think that we've heard that too, but where the entrance or the exit is with the trucks, crossing over three lanes, you know, the other two lanes to get to the turn one to go 495. I can't see it with, with the drawing that you have there. So it's the approximate site of the, Exit on there. Yes, it gets cut off in the bottom left, but it's, it's approximately right where um, rapid refill. Um, yeah, can you show me on that right right above? It's cut off. You can't, you can't see it. Yeah, I don't know. So if you're able to see all that. Yeah, it's literally here. Yeah, no, I mean, so he's I guess my concern is on Maple, Maple Street. Street. If the trucks are exiting your facility on Maple Street. Can you show Coming, us where? Come, yeah, can you show us where on that drawing? And then, on Maple Street. Yeah, it would be. I, I, it would be uh, above it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah the lanes. The lanes go back about two hundred and sixty. They're going to go into one lane at that. It's beyond that. Right. So they're not crossing over multiple lanes when they enter. Yeah. They, 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 the one single lane, and then that one single lane comes down into this and gets divided. The 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 you know, can I make a suggestion? Um, John, if you could put up your building, you could show approximately how long the, with, when the lanes start to widen out, and it's going to be about two thirds of the distance down the building. The driveway is beyond that. So the trucks will turn on to Maple Street on, onto, the, onto the lane of traffic that's available at that point. And then like every other vehicle going south on Maple Street, you know, either go into the right lane, the left lane, or, or the center lane. You know, we don't expect any of our trucks to go into the right lane because if somebody really, the truck really wanted to go right, they wouldn't go to the Maple Street uh, uh, intersection. They would just make a right turn onto Mechanic Street, skip the whole intersection. So the trucks are either gonna go straight or as you're, as it was correctly pointed out, almost all of the trucks are gonna be making a left and yeah, going to 490. I guess in a future meeting, can we have a drawing that that just shows where the driveway is, where the, yeah. all the lanes are? And I think I agree with you. Maybe we need to see it too, but I would like to see a drawing. Yeah, we can have like that three D, so we can look at it from above and street level. We we understand. We can prepare that for you, and we will. At least you freaking could do. Um, yeah. So what we'll do? We'll take. We'll give Sean. Our, our our site plan to put it onto that is lane striping plan so you can see exactly where those are and if the, the board um can let us know what date they'd like to go out there i can have everything staked out prior to that i don't want to put the stakes out too early because a lot of times they get torn out and whatnot i think what we may want to do on that and we can discuss that probably at the next meeting is i want to make sure the um we have a police officer there because I suspect we could be walking on back and forth on Maple Street and crossing the street. And when you put the stakes, since we're looking at a long distance, we're going to need the flags up fairly high that morning so we can visualize, you know, 250 feet down the road, another 250 feet down the road, the entrance on Mechanic Street. So we get a proper perception of the depth and the distance of what we're dealing with. And then we'll talk, Jim or someone will talk to make sure it's safe for us walking back and forth across the street because we could slow traffic up yeah. for a few moments, most likely on a Saturday. 
Rob? Are you done, Phil? Okay. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am done. All right. All right. Fair enough. Um, so I guess regarding the curb cuts, so mechanic street trucks are entering and they can turn right at that curb cut to go towards the center of town. That's what I, I understand, correct? And no left turn, which for trucks or any vehicle actually, I guess. And that's gonna be, you're thinking signage to, posting signage to say, do not turn left. Could. Correct. So, so obviously at, at the car at the car lot, we can be very clear. You know, right turn only. Do, you know, do not enter and stuff like that. So they know not to loop around the building at the truck court because we operationally you don't want that. Up at the Mechanic Street exit, um, obviously for geometry, you can't restrict you know the left the left turn. You know, somebody could do it if they if they wanted to, but so it has to be done with signage. You know, it would be very clear. On, on signage, and we can also just make sure there's signage throughout the site as well to say, you know, if you want to head to you know 495 or to 140 in whatever direction, you know, use Maple Street. So we can add advanced signage as well, so so folks know which way to go. Gotcha. And we'll we'll work with with Rashawn to come up with what um, you know what that directional signage would make the most sense. I guess just my one comment would be, I've heard numerous of these meetings from the butters saying that you know there's there's conditions regulating truck traffic there's signage up and still vehicles are going where they want and i get it i mean <clears throat> people are going to go where they want to go and it's tough to regulate even and, you know not everyone follows signage so if it's possible especially at the mechanic street curb cooks it's going to be very difficult to do it i think at the yeah, Maple Street curb cut, not Mechanic Street. Mechanic Street's gonna be difficult to do this, but to try and design the curb cut to make it so a truck, it's impossible for them to take a left turn. A truck to go left on Maple, is what you're saying. Exactly, to start yep. going to the residential area. So reducing the radius of the curb cut, um, potentially. I don't know how it would work, I can't really visualize it right now, but even potentially a raised center island potentially to separate entrance and exit. Um, so that way, if a truck did want to go to Maple Street, they'd have to move <laughs> it. It's not going to fare well on their wheels if they're jumping a granite curb. So um, just items to look at. I don't think if you have vehicles entering and exiting at Mechanic Street, I don't see how it would be possible to do that there it'd have to be through signage and, the way. yeah so unless it was an entrance only but i can understand the issue with having it an entrance only. So, yeah yeah it, it would just put pressure on the intersection when you wouldn't you know, yeah i, I yep way. i get it absolutely um and then additionally i think to brian dennis's point regarding stacking on street or queuing correct that's what you guys are bringing up i know so right now there's no tenant yet selected correct mm -hmm. so we don't really know what size trucks are going to be <clears throat> entering and exiting the site um it could be wb50 it could be wb67 it could be su30 it could be box truck you know who knows mm -hmm. um so i guess when you're looking at the queuing could you please just look at the most restrictive that you think could potentially be entering the site? So, um, oh yeah, and one other comment that's a little bit, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, that's not really, um, I listened into the, the Conservation Commission meeting last I know, night, which, I know was, which was, continue but there was one comment that they just requested or it's going to be brought up at the next conservation meeting <coughs> regarding snow storage mm -hmm. so just fair warning that um, when you're doing the site plan um they're probably yeah, going to want to see that yeah we, so. we, we um, received that comment our first um our first hearing with the commission that's one thing we wanted to show we can get absolutely so we're going to get all the comments and 
put it on that set of plants. Absolutely. Thank you, though, for that. No problem. <laughs> I'm honest. You're next. <laughs> well, I think everyone's kind of talked all the issues to death, so I don't have any questions. But I, I think I need to see it, so site walk is good. I would suggest, and I know this is probably difficult for everyone's schedule, we really should go down at a peak queuing time, not a Saturday morning. Okay, that's, I just thought less, with impact traffic less walking around that was my concern. I agree but I don't think we'll see the full impact unless okay. we're there on a Wednesday at four o'clock or something like that which okay. I know can be difficult to coordinate with everyone's schedule um but I, that would be my preference yeah, because fine. those are the times that I notice when I'm going through there those are kind of peak times that's very fair so can I just make maybe a suggestion for that well, I think that's a good point why don't they stake it we have a site visit on a Saturday and then at, leave the states there, and then we can add our whenever we can. Leisure go back or go someone back. video it or something. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So then people will just do that on their own. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, just one, one comment in response to what the board member just said about um, prohibiting that left turn up by trucks out onto Mechanic Street. And I, I, I I understand people drive where they drive, but what I could, what we can offer, and I and I don't know if this is what the planning board normally does in Bellingham, but it it's, could be a good practice. But and it, and, it, and it does help that situation is when it's a condition of our site plan approval that that left turn is prohibited. We, we, just the planning board should require us to include in any lease document that we make with any of our tenants that that left turn prohibition be specifically called out in our lease so that if we have a tenant who's a chronic offender and we get a call from the town saying hey your tenant is making a left turn we'll have we'll have um uh the legal rights set out in the lease that they're violating their lease if they do that. So uh, on this subject, you know, uh, I'm offering to include the uh, no left turn prohibition in the lease instruments that we make with our tenants and you could require that in your permit. Is that a common um, feature that you put in lease documents? You know, I sometimes it's not that common. I don't understand why boards. I do a lot of this work and have appeared maybe in front of a hundred cities and towns in the in the Commonwealth. I don't know why I don't see it more often. But there are times when boards, when there is a condition like that, a, an operational condition, you know, just require the property owner to include that operational condition in their lease. To the tenants. I mean, it's it's a condition of our permit. We got to abide by it. We should be making our tenants abide by it by putting it in the lease. And if they violate it, they're breaching the lease. I, I, again, that's not, I can't say that there won't be some truck driver who goes where he wants. I'm not saying that. I agree with the comment made by the board member that people do what they want to do, even when there's a posted sign. But if it's chronic and it really becomes an, a, 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 it starts creating a problem for the town, that gives everybody a mechanism to have it addressed. And I just wanted to point that out that that's something you could require of us and wouldn't be objected by, by my client. And if it's a, a, a tool that the planning board finds useful in other circumstances, great. You'll, you'll use it when you see fit. Just one follow up question How mm -hmm. enforceable is that if you sell the building? To a new owner, and they're less. Well, it's a condition. If it's a condition of the site plan, then it's then that runs with the land. So that's a condition of to every owner. If it's a condition in our site plan that you can't make a left turn, and if there's an added condition that says, and any lease made by the owner shall include that prohibition in the lease instrument, well. That's every owner is going to have to do that. If we sell the building or not, your site plan approval runs with the land as a as a title uh, requirement. They don't be there in perpetuity. Okay, thank you. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I wanted something. 
uh, going back to what Rob said, where um, it's almost difficult without damaging the vehicle um, to not go um, left. I don't want people turning right. Jim, in regards to prohibiting left turns and um, access from um, current warehouses in uh, Bellingham, what's your experience been? We've tried that, correct? Right, we have done similar uh, methods as Mr. Feldman had mentioned, just north of um, on Maple Street there, and and also the the the, the barriers to potentially damage uh, uh, tires. I mean, some uh, we might hear from the public who might uh, say otherwise, but I think uh, overall it's been fairly effective. There's been minimal truck drivers. I will say. Mr. Feldman is absolutely right. There is certainly the odd, odd truck that is gonna not take, not gonna read the 20 signs they pass that says don't take a left. But uh, you know, uh, the vast majority of them, I think, are abiding by it when when it's done right in terms of site plan and in terms of uh, proper uh, restrictions in place. I suspect when we open up the public, we'll hear some concerns that um, <clears throat> people have turned the wrong way onto um, Maple and High Street, facing some of our current warehouses. And we try to control that as best we can. Um, that's all the comments I have. <clears throat> Frank, before I turn it over to the public, do you have anything else you wanna add? No, I think this has been very productive in, in sort of giving us a direction. So I'm, I thank everyone for that. So I would like to turn it over to the public for what has been discussed this evening so far. Jim, um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, is that Michael Herring, Mike? Yeah, Mike, Mike stands for the yes. double header, it looks like. Yeah, the double header, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so now it seems clear that the, the proposal of the, propo of the applicant is to provide Trucks, all trucks entering only in through the Mechanic Street. That was clear. That's uh, uh, not yeah, Mechanic Street. Sorry, it's clarified. Um, the the restriction of the trucks going out of that entrance, leaving the site, and only being able to turn right makes me wonder how does that uh, jibe with what was approved, I believe, um, in the way of restrictions for the warehouse just down the street. The um, I forget who's uh, Cisco, not Cisco. Uh, the the large warehouse is just Lincoln National. What's that? Lincoln National warehouse. Is it Lincoln National? It's it's got a new uh, sign out it's saying that they're they're on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that that the one that's going to have the light put in it, opposite Curtis Apartments. Um, I think that we spent a lot of time. The planning board spent a lot of time restricting the trucks from going towards the center Bellingham. That they the drivers were going to be instructed to leave. <laughs> that entrance onto Mechanic Street and only turn left. That's why there was gonna be a light there, in fact. Um, so I thought part of it was we just didn't want a lot of truck traffic going into the center of Bellingham uh, for a lot of reasons, then going all the way up 126 to mm -hmm. get to 495 or whatever. And that most of the trucks would want to get to 495. Uh, it seems to me that some of the trucks are gonna to wanna to do that and then they're gonna come up to this center of town after going through Two different lights and and then to get the headlights center of town is that a change in direction of the planning board are you okay with having trucks being directed out of mechanics onto mechanic street and only being able to turn towards center town i'm not an advocate of left turns don't get me wrong i think that'd be crazy i've been through that intersection over the last 30 plus years commuting over several thousand times so i'm very familiar with it at all different times and a left turn of trucks out there right opposite rapid refill um would be a nightmare. Um, but I just want to make sure I'm clear. So the uh, understanding is, is there a change in the planning board's view that trucks going towards the center of town are okay? I don't think we're saying that's okay. What I think we're trying to do is try to reduce the impact on Maple Street as best we can. Right. I, 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 I yeah, I agree with that. Okay. So if they do, I, they don't, do. Think, I don't think like in an ideal world, I don't know if we can do both. You know, perhaps we can, but we're trying to be hearing from the neighbors on Maple Street, and we've been hearing for a while. Yeah. Um, get, getting vehicles crossing, it's it's going to queue up traffic a lot more 
on Maple Street if everything went out uh, onto Maple Street. Right. And we anticipate that it may be infrequent vehicles that will go through the center of the town. Right. Based, I, on location, I... based on the location of where we are, the advantage of this property is easy on, easy access to 495 and the exit. So our, our intent, attempt in intent is to hopefully direct the traffic. I'll be unpopular again through Franklin, right. so to speak. Um, so uh, speaking about Maple Street, uh, the, all the trucks are coming out uh, that are coming out and turning right on Maple Street. Um, they are turning before it becomes the three three lanes wide. I understand that. Um, what is the turn radius of an 18 wheeler? Does anybody know that? Because unless you're widening Maple Street, as you get up towards where I believe the entrance would be, I'd have to look at it on the staked out um, site plan, a site when you actually stake it out. That road is not particularly wide, and I have a tough time picturing an 18 wheeler making a smart 90 degree turn without cutting over into the other side, the other lane in that in that area. You're only two lanes wide at that particular point, correct? One going north and one going south. I believe so, sir. Okay, so I just bring that up. Uh, I since nobody threw out how wide an 18 wheel is, my next question is going to be, well, how wide are the lanes there in that area where it's going to be turning out of the uh, exit of the site? Um, that's a safety concern. Obviously, crossing the line would be a big slamming on the brakes for people who are zooming north on Maple Street, having been thrilled that they got through the uh, the lights there and on their way home. Um, and also, uh, it would also stop traffic, obviously, um, suddenly. The trucks turning into the uh, Mechanic Street entrance, having just come through the lights, what's the distance between the lights and that entrance going to be? Anyone? Two, two truck lengths, one truck length, does anybody know? I think it's more than that, sir. Yeah, it's okay. a, little more, a little more than that. A little more than that. My concern yeah, would be. I think it's a lot more, Mike. Yeah, a lot more. Okay. I, I, again, let's showing that on when you have it all laid out. There would be a great visual for uh, people. We'll have it more laid out at the next meeting. Yeah, that, I think that'd be really helpful, and a, and a 3D site plan certainly with all that marked out and trucks going out. Um, I'd be worried about trucks stop stop coming to a stop as they turn in. They're not going to wheel in at 45 miles an hour. The road speed is, um, and uh, it's not slow down traffic. So there'll be a lot of cars stopping on the brakes again, not anticipating that this truck is because they're not paying attention as people aren't usually doing when they're driving. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about safety uh, and primarily that, you know, trucks are turning in suddenly. Uh, they weren't anticipating that. People are slamming on the brakes and then truck traffic starts backing up. Um, the, uh, the traffic study itself, I did some reading of it. I didn't re finish reading all of it thoroughly, but I understand it refers to them doing a pre-COVID traffic getting pre-COVID traffic numbers um, and also doing a baseline of one day in April of 2021, I believe it was, for a couple of hours in the morning, a couple of hours in the afternoon to, to get a baseline. Um, and it does say that they're referring to the other property developments in the area, but I don't see anything delineating how much traffic they think is coming from all of these different sources, the Curtis Apartments, Amazon's warehouse uh, adds a tremendous, tremendous amount of traffic coming down Maple, but uh, Mechanic Street, the the new Red Mill project, the residential is going in as well as the warehouse, um, all the existing traffic, and a large number of the Amazon vehicles, by the way, do go straight through the intersection uh, to get gassed up. I imagine some of the trucks will want to do that as well, uh, coming out of this facility, get gassed up right across the Rapid Refill since they are they do have diesel set up for trucks. So you're going to get a mixture of trucks going different directions, but I it, is that information available? How they came up with the specific numbers? The traffic say just as they did. We we can still. Uh, Frank, can you address that? Yeah. So so in, uh, there's a couple of questions there. I think I'll try to do each one of them. So when we spoke with the um, the planning department, one of the concerns was that you know some of the volumes out here may have been impacted by COVID, and then some of the volumes you know post COVID were higher because of Amazon. So what we did is we, we took basically a hybrid. We looked at the counts that were done pre-COVID before any, there was any adjustment in terms of volumes being dropped because of the pandemic. And then we did new counts that included the traffic associated with the Amazon facility. And, and basically, in any instance where the pre-COVID volumes were higher, took those volumes and, and adjusted them up even higher and used them for analysis. So we really used the worst case 
for all movements. Um, so, th so the Amazon traffic's in there. It was included in our counts. And then again, any instance where it, it was really on 140, where if the through traffic was higher, we used that as well. Um, we can certainly provide all the backup data for all the projects that we included, but, but quite frankly, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We took their studies, we looked at what their projections were, how much traffic was going through this intersection in each movement, and we added that in. So that's all been incorporated in there as well. Um, I think that may have been it. Um, I don't recall if there's another question. I think I think it was most of the counts in 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 the, distribu the distribution. Right. Frank, we don't we don't know how it's going to get through. Do you um, concur? Uh, uh, pretty pretty much. Uh, if the information gets made available and whether Excuse it's on the count. Excuse me for one second, Frank. Sure. Yep. Do you agree with um, what was said by the applicant? I I would. I mean, the data that I've been hearing is MassDOT has suggested to use traffic data pre-COVID. 2016, 2019. And obviously, if you've got a new tenant that's a high traffic generator like Amazon, I think that would be the right thing to do to try to compare the two and be conservative. Thank you. My, my concern would be, oh, hey, hey. yeah, my concern would be 2016, there was not a lot of the stuff that's currently there along what, both Mechanic Street and Maple Street as far as development, Mr. trucks, and you know, so forth. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'm just, clear, just to clarify it. So what Mr. Kelly had mentioned, he spoke to the planning office a few years back when this was originally being proposed. And, uh, and I gave him all of those uh, developments. So the, the Red Mill, the Curtis, uh, 160 Mechanic Street, Amazon, Snyder, all, all those. I, I try to grab as many as I can and, and Sean would push me away, but I, I, I certainly, he certainly has all, all the new developments that are being proposed. All right. Thank well, you, Jim. Okay. Thank you. Um, one other uh, anecdotal uh, point, the traffic has not come back to what it was pre-COVID, but it has certainly increased as I commute from the Franklin train station coming towards that intersection on 140. Um, traffic pre-COVID a couple of years back, during its peak rush hours uh, that come in bursts, like pretty much every time a train lets off, you get 400, 200 cars that are zooming down the road, a lot of them westbound to go one direction or another through that intersection. Uh, the uh, traffic used to back up as far as the Franklin, almost the Franklin Forest Park entrance, uh, certainly back to Gorelick. It is not always back that far, but during certain trains it, and certain times of the day in the afternoon rush, it will get that far back. The reason I'm mentioning that is, all these people having literally passed them on my bike or been in a car occasionally, want to get through that intersection rapidly. And while you're extending the right turn lane coming down in South Maple or Maple Street there in the south direction, that's great. That allows more people to queue up who also want to turn onto 140 and head in the same direction that these people, the majority of them are coming through that intersection straight through on 140. There are some left turners, but most of them are straight through and not too many turn right. Um, those people are going through that intersection. There's not a, there is not a no turn on red um, sign or indicator there, I believe, correct? So they're just going to do what anybody does nowadays when they're in a hurry to get wherever they want to go, which is take that right as soon as they think they've got the distance. If you put a truck entrance shortly beyond that right hand turn, I know it may seem like a ways down, but when you're stepping on the gas, trying to cut, looking back to your left at the traffic coming from Franklin, trying to cut in there because they have the light, but you got the right turn lane, so you're gonna to try to do it, and you zip in there, and there's a truck that just came through that intersection, you have no clue that they've just basically coming to a stop to turn into that <laughs> entrance. There's gonna be some problems, I can almost guarantee it. And I know that they eventually, um, they're all gonna get past that entrance, but then what they're gonna do is end up getting to a light, which is, I don't know, Jim, 2,000 2, yards down the street at the new warehouse entrance, and then another light just beyond that at the Blackstone Street. So there's gonna be traffic backing up along there too. Um, and I don't wanna make it <clears throat> seem to some of the people who may not know better or may not think better that uh, widening and lengthening the lane is great for right turns, but all it doing, is doing is feeding into a situation right at the intersection there, especially as I said, when a truck is turning right and stopping traffic as it turns into the right-hand lane there. Uh, into the entrance rather on the right, um, as well as the lights further down. There could be very well, we'll have to see during rush hours, um, 
traffic stopped at that light at the top of the hill just by Curtis Apartments, backing almost all the way up to the to the intersection of lights are. Maybe not. Maybe they'll be signalized and 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 uh, and and it'll be great. But um, with all the extra cars and coming out of Curtis now and all this, I can tell you right now, it's it's a terrible intersection to add more traffic to of any sort. And I know it may only be an incremental increase to the developer and the applicant, but to the people living and traveling through that area, it's going to make it substantially worse, um, no matter what you do almost. I mean, it's just, it's great for access if you're getting out of that spot, but it is, it's just pouring more traffic into a difficult situation. And um, that one that we can see has got hundreds more cars coming up in the next year or two as these other sites come online. Um, I won't talk any more, but any more time now. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else in the public? Mr. Martinez. <clears throat> Jim, anyone, anyone else have their hand raised? No, I don't see anybody else with their hand raised. Thank you. Um, it appears we probably would need to move this forward to uh, April 14th. <clears throat> I'm sorry. That would be the same night as depot. Will that give you enough time to do, get the information you need, and then we'll get you can talk to Jim, and based on tonight, we can try to scope out what we think we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair assessment? Fair. And then hopefully between now and then, we can try to uh, do at least one walk through. But I think it would it would be helpful um to look at things from a 3d standpoint <coughs> from a google viewpoint maybe before we even do a walkthrough just to have a better idea based on what has been discussed tonight so we get the you know, to make the most opportunity of our site visits that sounds like there will be two one at peak hour and one maybe on a saturday morning and we can try to coordinate that I would think it's appropriate. So I would entertain a motion for continuance to uh, April 14th. Unless anyone else has any questions. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. We have motioned the floor to continue 206 Mechanic Street Warehouse to uh, April 14th. Um, second, I'm on the agenda. Um, we have one. 52 Depot first, so this would be second, and we can put prospect in third. Okay. Mm -hmm. All in favor of the motion on the floor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Gentlemen, it's been a long evening for a few of you. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you very much. The people in the public, uh, Mike and Don and everyone else. Cassie, I want to thank you all for your input. The applicants, I want to thank you for your input as well. Thank you very much and have a safe drive home. Uh, we all had a chance to review uh, the minutes from the um, March 3rd, 2022 meeting. I move to yeah, please, can I first? Yes, uh, yeah. Um, second page, third paragraph, two question marks. It's valid. Uh, no, construction face with two question marks. Okay. Amy, we can get that fixed. Okay. Mr. Mr. Lucier's question that there was a condition regarding the construction face. Question mark, question Probably mark, construction you know. face. Well, that explains that I said it, so phase. people are questioning it. We can put that to face. I'll let phase. you know. Okay. Yeah. Great, That's thank an you. Easy one. Um, Amy's catch you on. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Amy's doing a great job. Uh, she is. I was not there, so I cannot vote, correct? You can vote on the minutes because you signed the minutes. Okay. You are good to go. All right. Mm -hmm. Me too. You did too. All right. Uh, motion the floor to approve the minutes from the March 3rd. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. Dennis, a second. I'm sorry. Get a second. That motion passes unanimously. Ryan, the floor's yours. I haven't moved above. 
No, no, you say you have a motion to close. Does Jim have anything else more you want to say? Jim, you want anything else you want to say? I have nothing else to say, no. Nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brian will let you. Are we keeping you up, Jimmy? <laughs> no. A no, motion to close or adjourn? Please say by missing eye. Second. Yes, aye. Third. It's late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.